This is the part 3 of Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. Reminiscences We left for St. Louis in the city of Baton Rouge, on a delightfully hot day, but with the main purpose of my visit but lamely accomplished. I had hoped to hunt up and talk with a hundred steamboatmen, but got so pleasantly involved in the social life of the town that I got nothing more than mere five-minute talks with a couple of dozen of the craft. I was on the bench of the pilot house when we backed out and straightened up for the start the boat pausing for a good ready, in the old-fashioned way, and the black smoke piling out of the chimneys equally in the old-fashioned way. Then we began to gather momentum, and presently were fairly underway and booming along. It was all as natural and familiar and so were the shoreward sights as if there had been no break in my river life. There was a cub, and I judged that he would take the wheel now and he did. Captain Bixby stepped into the pilot house. Presently the cub closed up on the rank of steamships. He made me nervous, for he allowed too much water to show between our boat and the ships. I knew quite well what was going to happen, because I could date back in my own life and inspect the record. The captain looked on, during a silent half minute, then took the wheel himself, and crowded the boat in, till she went scraping along within a handbreadth of the ships. It was exactly the favor which he had done me, about a quarter of a century before, in that same spot, the first time I ever steamed out of the port of New Orleans. It was a very great and sincere pleasure to me to see the thing repeated with somebody else as victim. We made Natchez, 300 miles, in 22 hours and a half much the swiftest passage I have ever made over that piece of water. The next morning I came on with the four o'clock watch, and saw Richie successfully run half a dozen crossings in a fog, using for his guidance the marked chart devised and patented by Bixby and himself. This sufficiently evidenced the great value of the chart. By and by, when the fog began to clear off, I noticed that the reflection of a tree in the smooth water of an overflowed bank, 600 yards away, was stronger and blacker than the ghostly tree itself. The faint spectral trees, dimly glimpsed through the shredding fog, were very pretty things to see. We had a heavy thunderstorm at Natchez, another at Vicksburg, and still another about 50 miles below Memphis. They had an old-fashioned energy which had long been unfamiliar to me. This third storm was accompanied by a raging wind. We tied up to the bank when we saw the tempest coming, and everybody left the pilot house but me. The wind bent the young trees down, exposing the pale underside of the leaves, and gust after gust followed, in quick succession, thrashing the branches violently up and down, and to this side and that, and creating swift waves of alternating green and white according to the side of the leaf that was exposed, and these waves raced after each other as do their kind over a wind-tossed field of oats. No color that was visible anywhere was quite natural all tints were charged with a leaden tinge from the solid cloud bank overhead. The river was leaden, all distances the same, and even the far-reaching ranks of combing white caps were dully shaded by the dark, rich atmosphere through which their swarming legions marched. The thunder peals were constant and deafening, explosion followed explosion with but inconsequential intervals between, and the reports grew steadily sharper and higher keyed, and more trying to the ear, the lightning was as diligent as the thunder, and produced effects which enchanted the eye and sent electric ecstasies of mixed delight and apprehension shivering along every nerve in the body in unintermittent procession. The rain poured down in amazing volume, the ear-splitting thunder peals broke nearer and nearer, the wind increased in fury and began to wrench off boughs and treetops and send them sailing away through space, the pilot house fell to rocking and straining and cracking and surging, and I went down in the hold to see what time it was. People boast a good deal about alpine thunderstorms, but the storms which I have had the luck to see in the Alps were not the equals of some which I have seen in the Mississippi Valley. I may not have seen the Alps do their best, of course, and if they can beat the Mississippi, I don't wish to. On this up trip I saw a little towhead, infant island, half a mile long, which had been formed during the past 19 years. Since there was so much time to spare that 19 years of it could be devoted to the construction of a mere towhead, where was the use, originally, in rushing this whole globe through in six days? 
it is likely that if more time had been taken, in the first place, the world would have been made right, and this ceaseless improving and repairing would not be necessary now. But if you hurry a world or a house, you are nearly sure to find out by and by that you have left out a towhead, or a broom closet, or some other little convenience, here and there, which has got to be supplied, no matter how much expense and vexation it may cost. We had a succession of black nights, going up the river, and it was observable that whenever we landed, and suddenly inundated the trees with the intense sunburst of the electric light, a certain curious effect was always produced, hundreds of birds flocked instantly out from the masses of shining green foliage, and went careering hither and thither through the white rays, and often a songbird tuned up and fell to singing. We judged that they mistook this superb artificial day for the genuine article. We had a delightful trip in that thoroughly well-ordered steamer, and regretted that it was accomplished so speedily. By means of diligence and activity, we managed to hunt out nearly all the old friends. One was missing, however, he went to his reward, whatever it was, two years ago. But I found out all about him. His case helped me to realize how lasting can be the effect of a very trifling occurrence. When he was an apprentice blacksmith in our village, and I a schoolboy, a couple of young Englishmen came to the town and sojourned a while, and one day they got themselves up in cheap royal finery and did the Richard Three Sword fight with maniac energy and prodigious powwow, in the presence of the village boys. This blacksmith cub was there, and the histrionic poison entered his bones. This vast, lumbering, ignorant, dull-witted lout was stage-struck, and irrecoverably. He disappeared, and presently turned up in St. Lewis. I ran across him there, by and by. He was standing musing on a street corner, with his left hand on his hip, the thumb of his right supporting his chin, face bowed and frowning, slouch hat pulled down over his forehead imagining himself to be Othello or some such character, and imagining that the passing crowd marked his tragic bearing and were awestruck. I joined him, and tried to get him down out of the clouds, but did not succeed. However, he casually informed me, presently, that he was a member of the Walnut Street Theatre Company and he tried to say it with indifference, but the indifference was thin, and a mighty exultation showed through it. He said he was cast for a part in Julius Caesar, for that night, and if I should come I would see him. If I should come. I said I wouldn't miss it if I were dead. I went away stupefied with astonishment, and saying to myself, how strange it is. We always thought this fellow a fool, yet the moment he comes to a great city where intelligence and appreciation abound, the talent concealed in this shabby napkin is at once discovered, and promptly welcomed and honored. But I came away from the theater that night disappointed and offended, for I had had no glimpse of my hero, and his name was not in the bills. I met him on the street the next morning, and before I could speak, he asked. Did you see me? No, you weren't there. He looked surprised and disappointed. He said yes, I was. Indeed I was. I was a Roman soldier. Which one? Why didn't you see them Roman soldiers that stood back there in a rank, and sometimes marched in procession around the stage? Do you mean the Roman army, those six sandaled roustabouts in nightshirts, with tin shields and helmets, that marched around treading on each other's heels, in charge of a spider-legged consumptive dressed like themselves? That's it? That's it? I was one of them Roman soldiers. I was the next to the last one. A half a year ago I used to always be the last one, but I've been promoted. Well, they told me that that poor fellow remained a Roman soldier to the last a matter of 34 years. Sometimes they cast him for a speaking part, but not an elaborate one. He could be trusted to go and say, my lord, the carriage waits, but if they ventured to add a sentence or two to this, his memory felt the strain and he was likely to misfire. Yet, poor devil, he had been patiently studying the part of Hamlet for more than thirty years, and he lived and died in the belief that some day he would be invited to play it. And this is what came of that fleeting visit of those young Englishmen to our village such ages and ages ago. 
What noble horseshoes this man might have made, but for those Englishmen, and what an inadequate Roman soldier he did make. A day or two after we reached St. Louis, I was walking along 4th Street when a grizzly-headed man gave a sort of start as he passed me, then stopped, came back, inspected me narrowly, with a clouding brow, and finally said with deep asperity. Look here, have you got that drink yet? A maniac, I judged, at first. But all in a flash I recognized him. I made an effort to blush that strained every muscle in me, and answered as sweetly and winningly as ever I knew how. Been a little slow, but am just this minute closing in on the place where they keep it. Come in and help. He softened, and said make it a bottle of champagne and he was agreeable. He said he had seen my name in the papers, and had put all his affairs aside and turned out, resolved to find me or die, and make me answer that question satisfactorily, or kill me, though the most of his late asperity had been rather counterfeit than otherwise. This meeting brought back to me the St. Louis riots of about thirty years ago. I spent a week there, at that time, in a boarding house, and had this young fellow for a neighbor across the hall. We saw some of the fightings and killings, and by and by we went one night to an armory where two hundred young men had met, upon call, to be armed and go forth against the rioters, under command of a military man. We drilled till about ten o'clock at night, then news came that the mob were in great force in the lower end of the town, and were sweeping everything before them. Our column moved at once. It was a very hot night, and my musket was very heavy. We marched and marched, and the nearer we approached the seat of war, the hotter I grew and the thirstier I got. I was behind my friend, so, finally, I asked him to hold my musket while I dropped out and got a drink. Then I branched off and went home. I was not feeling any solicitude about him of course, because I knew he was so well armed, now, that he could take care of himself without any trouble. If I had had any doubts about that, I would have borrowed another musket for him. I left the city pretty early the next morning, and if this grizzled man had not happened to encounter my name in the papers the other day in St. Louis, and felt moved to seek me out, I should have carried to my grave a heart-torturing uncertainty as to whether he ever got out of the riots all right or not. I ought to have inquired, thirty years ago, I know that. And I would have inquired, if I had had the muskets, but, in the circumstances, he seemed better fixed to conduct the investigations than I was. One Monday, near the time of our visit to St. Louis, the Globe Democrat came out with a couple of pages of Sunday statistics, whereby it appeared that 119,448 St. Louis people attended the morning and evening church services the day before, and 23,102 children attended Sunday school. Thus 142,550 persons, out of the city's total of 400,000 population, respected the day religious-wise. I found these statistics, in a condensed form, in a telegram of the Associated Press, and preserved them. They made it apparent that St. Lewis was in a higher state of grace than she could have claimed to be in my time. But now that I canvass the figures narrowly, I suspect that the telegraph mutilated them. It cannot be that there are more than 150,000 Catholics in the town, the other 250,000 must be classified as Protestants. Out of these 250,000, according to this questionable telegram, only 26,362 attended church and Sunday school, while out of the 150,000 Catholics, 116,188 went to church and Sunday school. A burning brand. All at once the thought came into my mind, I have not sought out Mr. Brown. Upon that text I desire to depart from the direct line of my subject, and make a little excursion. I wish to reveal a secret which I have carried with me nine years, and which has become burdensome. Upon a certain occasion, nine years ago, I had said, with strong feeling, if ever I see St. Lewis again, I will seek out Mr. Brown, the great grain merchant, 
and ask of him the privilege of shaking him by the hand. The occasion and the circumstances were as follows. A friend of mine, a clergyman, came one evening and said, I have a most remarkable letter here, which I want to read to you, if I can do it without breaking down. I must preface it with some explanations, however. The letter is written by an ex-thief and ex-vagabond of the lowest origin and basest rearing, a man all stained with crime and steeped in ignorance, but, thank God, with a mine of pure gold hidden away in him, as you shall see. His letter is written to a burglar named Williams, who is serving a nine-year term in a certain state prison, for burglary. Williams was a particularly daring burglar, and plied that trade during a number of years, but he was caught at last and jailed, to await trial in a town where he had broken into a house at night, pistol in hand, and forced the owner to hand over to him $8,000 in government bonds. Williams was not a common sort of person, by any means, he was a graduate of Harvard College, and came of good New England stock. His father was a clergyman. While lying in jail, his health began to fail, and he was threatened with consumption. This fact, together with the opportunity for reflection afforded by solitary confinement, had its effect its natural effect. He fell into serious thought, his early training asserted itself with power, and wrought with strong influence upon his mind and heart. He put his old life behind him, and became an earnest Christian. Some ladies in the town heard of this, visited him, and by their encouraging words supported him in his good resolutions and strengthened him to continue in his new life. The trial ended in his conviction and sentence to the state prison for the term of nine years, as I have before said. In the prison he became acquainted with the poor wretch referred to in the beginning of my talk, Jack Hunt, the writer of the letter which I am going to read. You will see that the acquaintanceship bore fruit for Hunt. When Hunt's time was out, he wandered to St. Lewis, and from that place he wrote his letter to Williams. The letter got no further than the office of the prison warden, of course, prisoners are not often allowed to receive letters from outside. The prison authorities read this letter, but did not destroy it. They had not the heart to do it. They read it to several persons, and eventually it fell into the hands of those ladies of whom I spoke a while ago. The other day I came across an old friend of mine a clergyman who had seen this letter, and was full of it. The mere remembrance of it so moved him that he could not talk of it without his voice breaking. He promised to get a copy of it for me, and here it is an exact copy, with all the imperfections of the original preserved. It has many slang expressions in it thieves argo but their meaning has been interlined, in parentheses, by the prison authorities St. Lewis, June 9, 1872. Mr. W. Friend Charlie if I may call you so, I know you are surprised to get a letter from me, but I hope you won't be mad at my writing to you. I want to tell you my thanks for the way you talked to me when I was in prison it has led me to try and be a better man, I guess you thought I did not care for what you said, and at the first go off I didn't, but I knowed you was a man who had done big work with good men and want no sucker, nor want gassing and all the boys nodded. I used to think at night what you said, and for it I knocked off swearing months before my time was up, for I saw it want no good, know how the day my time was up you told me if I would shake the cross, quit stealing, and live on the square for months it would be the best job I ever done in my life. The state agent give me a ticket to here, and on the car I thought more of what you said to me, but didn't make up my mind. When we got to Chicago on the cars from there to here, I pulled off an old woman's leather, robbed her of her pocketbook, I hadn't no more than got it off when I wished I hadn't done it, for a while before that I made up my mind to be a square bloke, four months on your word, but forgot it when I saw the leather was a grip, easy to get, but I kept close to her and when she got out of the cars at a way place I said, Marm have you lost anything? And she tumbled, discovered, her leather was off, gone, is this it says I, giving it to her well if you ain't honest, says she, but I hadn't got cheek enough to stand that sort of talk, so I left her in a hurry. 
when I got here I had $1.25 left and I didn't get no work for three days as I ain't strong enough for roust about on a steamboat, for a deck hand, the afternoon of the third day I spent my last 10 CTS for moons, large, round sea biscuit, and cheese and I felt pretty rough and was thinking I would have to go on the dipe, picking pockets, again, when I thought of what you once said about a fellow's calling on the Lord when he was in hard luck, and I thought I would try it once anyhow, but when I tried it I got stuck on the start, and all I could get off was, Lord give a poor fellow a chance to square it for three months for Christ's sake, Amen, and I kept a thinking, of it over and over as I went along about an hour after that I was in 4th St. And this is what happened and is the cause of my being where I am now and about which I will tell you before I get done writing. As I was walking along heard a big noise and saw a horse running away with a carriage with two children in it, and I graved up a piece of box cover from the sidewalk and run in the middle of the street, and when the horse came up I smashed him over the head as hard as I could drive the board split to pecks and the horse checked up a little and I grabbed the reins and pulled his head down until he stopped the gentleman what owned him came running up and soon as he saw the children were all right, he shook hands with me and gave me a fifty dollar green back, and my asking the Lord to help me come into my head, and I was so thunderstruck I couldn't drop the reins nor say nothing he saw something was up, and coming back to me said, my boy are you hurt? And the thought come into my head just then to ask him for work, and I asked him to take back the bill and give me a job says he, jump in here and let's talk about it, but keep the money he asked me if I could take care of horses and I said yes, for I used to hang round livery stables and often would help clean and drive horses, he told me he wanted a man for that work, and would give me $16 a month and board me. You bet I took that chance at once. That night in my little room over the stable I sat a long time thinking over my past life and of what had just happened and I just got down on my knees and thanked the Lord for the job and to help me to square it, and to bless you for putting me up to it. And the next morning I done it again and got me some new togs, clothes, and a Bible for I made up my mind after what the Lord had done for me I would read the Bible every night and morning, and ask him to keep an eye on me. When I had been there about a week Mr. Brown, that's his name, came in my room one night and saw me reading the Bible he asked me if I was a Christian and I told him no he asked me how it was I read the Bible instead of papers and books well Charlie I thought I had better give him a square deal in the start, so I told him all about my being in prison and about you, and how I had almost done give up looking for work and how the Lord got me the job when I asked him, and the only way I had to pay him back was to read the Bible and square it, and I asked him to give me a chance for three months he talked to me like a father for a long time, and told me I could stay and then I felt better than ever I had done in my life, for I had given Mr. Brown a fair start with me and now I didn't fear no one giving me a back cap, exposing his past life, and running me off the job the next morning he called me into the library and gave me another square talk, and advised me to study some every day, and he would help me one or two hours every night. And he gave me an arithmetic, a spelling book, a geography and a writing book, and he hears me every night he lets me come into the house to prayers every morning, and got me put in a Bible class in the Sunday school which I likes very much for it helps me to understand my Bible better. Now, Charlie the three months on the square are up two months ago, and as you said, it is the best job I ever did in my life, and I commenced another of the same sort right away, only it is to God helping me to last a lifetime Charlie I wrote this letter to tell you I do think God has forgiven my sins and heard your prayers, for you told me you should pray for me I know I love to read his word and tell him all my troubles and he helps me I know for I have plenty of chances to steal but I don't feel to as I once did and now I take more pleasure in going to church than to the theater and that wasn't so once our minister and others often talk with me and a month ago they wanted me to join the church, but I said no, not now, I may be mistaken in my feelings, I will wait a while, but now I feel that God has called me and on the first Sunday in July I will join the church dear friend I wish I could write to you as I feel. But I can't do it yet you know I learned to read and write while prisons and I ain't got well enough along to write as I would talk, 
I know I ain't spelled all the words right in this and lots of other mistakes but you will excuse it I know, for you know I was brought up in a poor house until I run away, and that I never knew who my father and mother was and I don't know my right name, and I hope you won't be mad at me, but I have as much right to one name as another and I have taken your name, for you won't use it when you get out I know, and you are the man I think most of in the world, so I hope you won't be mad I am doing well, I put $10 a month in bank with $25 of the $1.50 if you ever want any or all of it let me know, and it is yours. I wish you would let me send you some now. I send you with this a receipt for a year of Little's living age, I didn't know what you would like and I told Mr. Brown and he said he thought you would like it I wish I was near you so I could send you Chuck, refreshments, on holidays, it would spoil this weather from here, but I will send you a box next Thanksgiving anyway next week Mr. Brown takes me into his store as light porter and will advance me as soon as I know a little more he keeps a big granary store, wholesale I forgot to tell you. Of my mission school, Sunday school class tehe school is in the Sunday afternoon, I went out two Sunday afternoons, and picked up seven kids, little boys, and got them to come in. Two of them knew as much as I did and I had them put in a class where they could learn something. I don't know much myself, but as these kids can't read I get on nicely with them. I make sure of them by going after them every Sunday hour before school time, I also got four girls to come. Tell Mac and Harry about me. If they will come out here when their time is up I will get them jobs at once. I hope you will excuse this long letter and all mistakes, I wish I could see you for I can't write as I would talk I hope the warm weather is doing your lungs good I was afraid when you was bleeding you would die give my respects to all the boys and tell them how I am doing I am doing well and everyone here treats me as kind as they can Mr. Brown is going to write to you sometime I hope someday you will write to me, this letter is from your very true friend. C.W. Who you know as Jack Hunt. I send you Mr. Brown's card. Send my letter to him. Here was true eloquence, irresistible eloquence, and without a single grace or ornament to help it out. I have seldom been so deeply stirred by any piece of writing. The reader of it halted, all the way through, on a lame and broken voice, yet he had tried to fortify his feelings by several private readings of the letter before venturing into company with it. He was practicing upon me to see if there was any hope of his being able to read the document to his prayer meeting with anything like a decent command over his feelings. The result was not promising. However, he determined to risk it, and did. He got through tolerably well, but his audience broke down early, and stayed in that condition to the end. The fame of the letter spread through the town. A brother minister came and borrowed the manuscript, put it bodily into a sermon, preached the sermon to twelve hundred people on a Sunday morning, and the letter drowned them in their own tears. Then my friend put it into a sermon and went before his Sunday morning congregation with it. It scored another triumph. The house wept as one individual. My friend went on summer vacation up into the fishing regions of our northern British neighbors, and carried the sermon with him, since he might possibly chance to need a sermon. He was asked to preach, one day. The little church was full. Among the people present were the late Dr. J.G. Holland, the late Mr. Seymour of the New York Times, Mr. Page, the philanthropist and temperance advocate, and, I think, Senator Fry, of Maine. The marvelous letter did its wanted work, all the people were moved, all the people wept, the tears flowed in a steady stream down Dr. Holland's cheeks, and nearly the same can be said with regard to all who were there. Mr. Page was so full of enthusiasm over the letter that he said he would not rest until he made pilgrimage to that prison, and had speech with the man who had been able to inspire a fellow unfortunate to write so priceless a tract. Ah, that unlucky Page, and another man. If they had only been in Jericho, that letter would have rung through the world and stirred all the hearts of all the nations for a thousand years to come, and nobody might ever have found out that it was the confoundedest, brazenest, ingeniousest piece of fraud and humbuggery that was ever concocted to fool poor confiding mortals with. The letter was a pure swindle, and that is the truth. And take it by and large, 
it was without a compere among swindles. It was perfect, it was rounded, symmetrical, complete, colossal. The reader learns it at this point, but we didn't learn it till some miles and weeks beyond the stage of the affair. My friend came back from the woods, and he and other clergymen and lay missionaries began once more to inundate audiences with their tears and the tears of said audiences, I begged hard for permission to print the letter in a magazine and tell the watery story of its triumphs, numbers of people got copies of the letter, with permission to circulate them in writing, but not in print, copies were sent to the Sandwich Islands and other far regions. Charles Dudley Warner was at church, one day, when the worn letter was read and wept over. At the church door, afterward, he dropped a peculiarly cold iceberg down the clergyman's back with the question do you know that letter to be genuine? It was the first suspicion that had ever been voiced, but it had that sickening effect which first uttered suspicions against one's idol always have. Some talk followed. Why what should make you suspect that it isn't genuine? Nothing that I know of, except that it is too neat and compact and fluent, and nicely put together for an ignorant person, an unpractised hand. I think it was done by an educated man. The literary artist had detected the literary machinery. If you will look at the letter now, you will detect it yourself it is observable in every line. Straightway the clergyman went off, with the seed of suspicion sprouting in him, and wrote to a minister residing in that town where Williams had been jailed and converted, asked for light, and also asked if a person in the literary line, meaning me, might be allowed to print the letter and tell its history. He presently received this answer. Rev. My dear friend in regard to that convict's letter there can be no doubt as to its genuineness. Williams, to whom it was written, lay in our jail and professed to have been converted, and Rev. Mr., the chaplain, had great faith in the genuineness of the change as much as one can have in any such case. The letter was sent to one of our ladies, who is a Sunday school teacher, sent either by Williams himself, or the chaplain of the state's prison, probably. She has been greatly annoyed in having so much publicity, lest it might seem a breach of confidence, or be an injury to Williams. In regard to its publication, I can give no permission, though if the names and places were omitted, and especially if sent out of the country, I think you might take the responsibility and do it. It is a wonderful letter, which no Christian genius, much less one unsanctified, could ever have written. As showing the work of grace in a human heart, and in a very degraded and wicked one, it proves its own origin and reproves our weak faith in its power to cope with any form of wickedness. M. R. Brown of S.T. Lewis, some one said, was a Hartford man. Do all whom you send from Hartford serve their master as well? P. S. Williams is still in the state's prison, serving out a long sentence of nine years, I think. He has been sick and threatened with consumption, but I have not inquired after him lately. This lady that I speak of corresponds with him, I presume, and will be quite sure to look after him. This letter arrived a few days after it was written and up went Mr. Williams's stock again. Mr. Warner's low-down suspicion was laid in the cold, cold grave, where it apparently belonged. It was a suspicion based upon mere internal evidence, anyway, and when you come to internal evidence, it's a big field and a game that two can play at, as witness this other internal evidence, discovered by the writer of the note above quoted that it is a wonderful letter which no Christian genius, much less one unsanctified, could ever have written. I had permission now to print provided I suppressed names and places and sent my narrative out of the country. So I chose an Australian magazine for vehicle, as being far enough out of the country, and set myself to work on my article. And the ministers set the pumps going again, with the letter to work the handles. But meantime Brother Page had been agitating. He had not visited the penitentiary, but he had sent a copy of the illustrious letter to the chaplain of that institution, and accompanied it with apparently inquiries. He got an answer, dated four days later than that other brother's reassuring epistle, and before my article was complete, it wandered into my hands. The original is before me, now, 
and I here append it. It is pretty well loaded. With internal evidence of the most solid description states prison, chaplain's office, July 11, 1873. Dear bro. Page here with please find the letter kindly loaned me. I am afraid its genuineness cannot be established. It purports to be addressed to some prisoner here. No such letter ever came to a prisoner here. All letters received are carefully read by officers of the prison before they go into the hands of the convicts, and any such letter could not be forgotten. Again, Charles Williams is not a Christian man, but a dissolute, cunning prodigal, whose father is a minister of the gospel. His name is an assumed one. I am glad to have made your acquaintance. I am preparing a lecture upon life seen through prison bars, and should like to deliver the same in your vicinity. And so ended that little drama. My poor article went into the fire, for whereas the materials for it were now more abundant and infinitely richer than they had previously been, there were parties all around me, who, although longing for the publication before, were a unit for suppression at this stage and complexion of the game. They said, wait the wound is too fresh, yet. All the copies of the famous letter except mine disappeared suddenly, and from that time onward, the aforetime same old drought set in in the churches. As a rule, the town was on a spacious grin for a while, but there were places in it where the grin did not appear, and where it was dangerous to refer to the ex-convict's letter. A word of explanation. Jack Hunt, the professed writer of the letter, was an imaginary person. The burglar Williams Harvard graduate, son of a minister wrote the letter himself, to himself, got it smuggled out of the prison, got it conveyed to persons who had supported and encouraged him in his conversion where he knew two things would happen, the genuineness of the letter would not be doubted or inquired into, and the nub of it would be noticed, and would have valuable effect the effect, indeed, of starting a movement to get Mr. Williams pardoned out of prison. That nub is so ingeniously, so casually, flung in, and immediately left there in the tail of the letter, undwelt upon, that an indifferent reader would never suspect that it was the heart and core of the epistle, if he even took note of it at all, this is the nub. I hope the warm weather is doing your lungs good I was afraid when you was bleeding you would die give my respects, etc. That is all there is of it simply touch and go no dwelling upon it. Nevertheless it was intended for an eye that would be swift to see it, and it was meant to move a kind heart to try to effect the liberation of a poor reformed and purified fellow lying in the fell grip of consumption. When I for the first time heard that letter read, nine years ago, I felt that it was the most remarkable one I had ever encountered. And it so warmed me toward Mr. Brown of St. Lewis that I said that if ever I visited that city again, I would seek out that excellent man and kiss the hem of his garment if it was a new one. Well, I visited St. Lewis, but I did not hunt for Mr. Brown, for, alas, the investigations of long ago had proved that the benevolent Brown, like Jack Hunt, was not a real person, but a sheer invention of that gifted rascal, Williams Burglar, Harvard graduate, son of a clergyman. My boyhood's home. We took passage in one of the fast boats of the St. Lewis and St. Paul Packet Company, and started up the river. When I, as a boy, first saw the mouth of the Missouri River, it was 22 or 23 miles above St. Lewis, according to the estimate of pilots, the wear and tear of the banks have moved it down 8 miles since then, and the pilots say that within 5 years the river will cut through and move the mouth down 5 miles more, which will bring it within 10 miles of St. Lewis. About nightfall we passed the large and flourishing town of Alton, Illinois, and before daylight next morning the town of Louisiana, Missouri, a sleepy village in my day, but a brisk railway center now, however, all the towns out there are railway centers now. I could not clearly recognize the place. This seemed odd to me, for when I retired from the rebel army in 61 I retired upon Louisiana in good order, at least in good enough order for a person who had not yet learned how to retreat according to the rules of war, and had to trust to native genius. It seemed to me that for a first attempt at a retreat it was not badly done. 
I had done no advancing in all that campaign that was at all equal to it. There was a railway bridge across the river here well sprinkled with glowing lights, and a very beautiful sight it was. At seven in the morning we reached Hannibal, Missouri, where my boyhood was spent. I had had a glimpse of it fifteen years ago, and another glimpse six years earlier, but both were so brief that they hardly counted. The only notion of the town that remained in my mind was the memory of it as I had known it when I first quitted it twenty-nine years ago. That picture of it was still as clear and vivid to me as a photograph. I stepped ashore with the feeling of one who returns out of a dead and gone generation. I had a sort of realizing sense of what the Bastille prisoners must have felt when they used to come out and look upon Paris after years of captivity, and note how curiously the familiar and the strange were mixed together before them. I saw the new houses I saw them plainly enough but they did not affect the older picture in my mind, for through their solid bricks and mortar I saw the vanished houses, which had formerly stood there, with perfect distinctness. It was Sunday morning, and everybody was abed yet. So I passed through the vacant streets, still seeing the town as it was, and not as it is, and recognizing and metaphorically shaking hands with a hundred familiar objects which no longer exist, and finally climbed Holiday's Hill to get a comprehensive view. The whole town lay spread out below me then, and I could mark and fix every locality, every detail. Naturally, I was a good deal moved. I said, many of the people I once knew in this tranquil refuge of my childhood are now in heaven, some, I trust, are in the other place. The things about me and before me made me feel like a boy again convinced me that I was a boy again, and that I had simply been dreaming an unusually long dream, but my reflections spoiled all that, for they forced me to say, I see fifty old houses down yonder, into each of which I could enter and find either a man or a woman who was a baby or unborn when I noticed those houses last, or a grandmother who was a plump young bride at that time. From this vantage ground the extensive view up and down the river, and wide over the wooded expanses of Illinois, is very beautiful one of the most beautiful on the Mississippi, I think, which is a hazardous remark to make, for the 800 miles of river between St. Louis and St. Paul afford an unbroken succession of lovely pictures. It may be that my affection for the one in question biases my judgment in its favor, I cannot say as to that. No matter, it was satisfyingly beautiful to me, and it had this advantage over all the other friends whom I was about to greet again, it had suffered no change, it was as young and fresh and comely and gracious as ever it had been, whereas, the faces of the others would be old, and scarred with the campaigns of life, and marked with their griefs and defeats, and would give me no upliftings of spirit. An old gentleman, out on an early morning walk, came along, and we discussed the weather, and then drifted into other matters. I could not remember his face. He said he had been living here twenty-eight years. So he had come after my time, and I had never seen him before. I asked him various questions, first about a mate of mine in Sunday school what became of him. He graduated with honor in an eastern college, wandered off into the world somewhere, succeeded at nothing, passed out of knowledge and memory years ago, and is supposed to have gone to the dogs. He was bright, and promised well when he was a boy. Yes, but the thing that happened is what became of it all. I asked after another lad, altogether the brightest in our village school when I was a boy. He, too, was graduated with honors, from an eastern college, but life whipped him in every battle, straight along, and he died in one of the territories, years ago, a defeated man. I asked after another of the bright boys. He is a success, always has been, always will be, I think. I inquired after a young fellow who came to the town to study for one of the professions when I was a boy. He went at something else before he got through went from medicine to law, or from law to medicine then to some other new thing, went away for a year, came back with a young wife, fell to drinking, then to gambling behind the door, finally took his wife and two young children to her father's, and went off to Mexico, went from bad to worse, and finally died there without a cent to buy a shroud, and without a friend to attend the funeral. 
pity, for he was the best-natured, and most cheery and hopeful young fellow that ever was. I named another boy. Oh, he is all right. Lives here yet, has a wife and children, and is prospering. Same verdict concerning other boys. I named three schoolgirls. The first two live here, are married and have children, the other is long ago dead never married. I named, with emotion, one of my early sweethearts. She is all right. Been married three times, buried two husbands, divorced from the third, and I hear she is getting ready to marry an old fellow out in Colorado somewhere. She's got children scattered around here and there, most everywheres. The answer to several other inquiries was brief and simple killed in the war. I named another boy. Well, now, his case is curious. There wasn't a human being in this town but knew that that boy was a perfect chucklehead, perfect dummy, just a stupid ass, as you may say. Everybody knew it, and everybody said it. Well, if that very boy isn't the first lawyer in the state of Missouri today. I'm a Democrat. Is that so? It's actually so. I'm telling you the truth. How do you account for it? Account for it? There ain't any accounting for it, except that if you send a damned fool to St. Lewis, and you don't tell them he's a damned fool they'll never find it out. There's one thing sure if I had a damned fool I should know what to do with him, ship him to St. Lewis it's the noblest market in the world for that kind of property. Well, when you come to look at it all around, and chew at it and think it over, don't it just bang anything you ever heard of? Well, yes, it does seem to. But don't you think maybe it was the Hannibal people who were mistaken about the boy, and not the St. Lewis people? Oh, nonsense. The people here have known him from the very cradle they knew him a hundred times better than the St. Lewis idiots could have known him. No, if you have got any damned fools that you want to realize on, take my advice send them to St. Lewis. I mentioned a great number of people whom I had formerly known. Some were dead, some were gone away, some had prospered, some had come to naught, but as regarded a dozen or so of the lot, the answer was comforting. Prosperous live here yet town littered with their children. I asked about Miss. Died in the insane asylum three or four years ago never was out of it from the time she went in, and was always suffering, too, never got a shred of her mind back. If he spoke the truth, here was a heavy tragedy, indeed. Thirty-six years in a madhouse, that some young fools might have some fun. I was a small boy, at the time, and I saw those giddy young ladies come tiptoeing into the room where Miss sat reading at midnight by a lamp. The girl at the head of the file wore a shroud and a doe face, she crept behind the victim, touched her on the shoulder, and she looked up and screamed, and then fell into convulsions. She did not recover from the fright, but went mad. In these days it seems incredible that people believed in ghosts so short a time ago. But they did. After asking after such other folk as I could call to mind, I finally inquired about myself. Oh. He succeeded well enough another case of damned fool. If they'd sent him to St. Lewis, he'd have succeeded sooner. It was with much satisfaction that I recognized the wisdom of having told this candid gentleman, in the beginning, that my name was Smith. Past and present. Being left to myself, up there, I went on picking out old houses in the distant town, and calling back their former inmates out of the moldy past. Among them I presently recognized the house of the father of Lem Hackett, fictitious name. It carried me back more than a generation in a moment, and landed me in the midst of a time when the happenings of life were not the natural and logical results of great general laws, but of special orders, and were freighted with very precise and distinct purposes partly punitive in intent, partly admonitory, and usually local in application. When I was a small boy, Lem Hackett was drowned on a Sunday. He fell out of an empty flatboat, where he was playing. Being loaded with sin, he went to the bottom like an anvil. He was the only boy in the village who slept that night. 
we others all lay awake, repenting. We had not needed the information, delivered from the pulpit that evening, that Lem's was a case of special judgment we knew that, already. There was a ferocious thunderstorm that night and it raged continuously until near dawn. The winds blew, the windows rattled, the rain swept along the roof in pelting sheets, and at the briefest of intervals the inky blackness of the night vanished, the houses over the way glared out white and blinding for a quivering instant, then the solid darkness shut down again and a splitting peal of thunder followed, which seemed to rend everything in the neighborhood to shreds and splinters. I sat up in bed quaking and shuddering, waiting for the destruction of the world, and expecting it. To me there was nothing strange or incongruous in heaven's making such an uproar about Lem Hackett. Apparently it was the right and proper thing to do. Not a doubt entered my mind that all the angels were grouped together, discussing this boy's case and observing the awful bombardment of our beggarly little village with satisfaction and approval. There was one thing which disturbed me in the most serious way, that was the thought that this centering of the celestial interest on our village could not fail to attract the attention of the observers to people among us who might otherwise have escaped notice for years. I felt that I was not only one of those people, but the very one most likely to be discovered. That discovery could have but one result, I should be in the fire with Lem before the chill of the river had been fairly warmed out of him. I knew that this would be only just and fair. I was increasing the chances against myself all the time, by feeling a secret bitterness against Lem for having attracted this fatal attention to me, but I could not help it this sinful thought persisted in infesting my breast in spite of me. Every time the lightning glared I caught my breath, and judged I was gone. In my terror and misery, I meanly began to suggest other boys, and mention acts of theirs which were wickeder than mine, and peculiarly needed punishment and I tried to pretend to myself that I was simply doing this in a casual way, and without intent to divert the heavenly attention to them for the purpose of getting rid of it myself. With deep sagacity I put these mentions into the form of sorrowing recollections and left-handed sham supplications that the sins of those boys might be allowed to pass unnoticed possibly they may repent. It is true that Jim Smith broke a window and lied about it but maybe he did not mean any harm. And although Tom Holmes says more bad words than any other boy in the village, he probably intends to repent though he has never said he would. And whilst it is a fact that John Jones did fish a little on Sunday, once, he didn't really catch anything but only just one small useless mud cat, and maybe that wouldn't have been so awful if he had thrown it back as he says he did, but he didn't. Pity but they would repent of these dreadful things and maybe they will yet. But while I was shamefully trying to draw attention to these poor chaps who were doubtless directing the celestial attention to me at the same moment, though I never once suspected that I had heedlessly left my candle burning. It was not a time to neglect even trifling precautions. There was no occasion to add anything to the facilities for attracting notice to me so I put the light out. It was a long night to me, and perhaps the most distressful one I ever spent. I endured agonies of remorse for sins which I knew I had committed, and for others which I was not certain about, yet was sure that they had been set down against me in a book by an angel who was wiser than I and did not trust such important matters to memory. It struck me, by and by, that I had been making a most foolish and calamitous mistake, in one respect, doubtless I had not only made my own destruction sure by directing attention to those other boys, but had already accomplished theirs. Doubtless the lightning had stretched them all dead in their beds by this time. The anguish and the fright which this thought gave me made my previous sufferings seem trifling by comparison. Things had become truly serious. I resolved to turn over a new leaf instantly, I also resolved to connect myself with the church the next day, if I survived to see its son appear. I resolved to cease from sin in all its forms, and to lead a high and blameless life forever after. I would be punctual at church and Sunday school, visit the sick, carry baskets of victuals to the poor, simply to fulfill the regulation conditions, although I knew we had none among us so poor but they would smash the basket over my head for my pains, I would instruct other boys in right ways, and take the resulting trouncings meekly, I would subsist entirely on tracks, I would invade the rum shop and warn the drunkard and finally, if I escaped the fate of those who early become too good to 
live, I would go for a missionary. The storm subsided toward daybreak, and I dozed gradually to sleep with a sense of obligation to Lem Hackett for going to eternal suffering in that abrupt way, and thus preventing a far more dreadful disaster my own loss. But when I rose refreshed, by and by, and found that those other boys were still alive, I had a dim sense that perhaps the whole thing was a false alarm, that the entire turmoil had been on Lem's account and nobody's else. The world looked so bright and safe that there did not seem to be any real occasion to turn over a new leaf. I was a little subdued, during that day, and perhaps the next, after that, my purpose of reforming slowly dropped out of my mind, and I had a peaceful, comfortable time again, until the next storm. That storm came about three weeks later, and it was the most unaccountable one, to me, that I had ever experienced, for on the afternoon of that day, Dutchie was drowned. Dutchie belonged to our Sunday school. He was a German lad who did not know enough to come in out of the rain, but he was exasperatingly good, and had a prodigious memory. One Sunday he made himself the envy of all the youth and the talk of all the admiring village, by reciting 3,000 verses of scripture without missing a word, then he went off the very next day and got drowned. Circumstances gave to his death a peculiar impressiveness. We were all bathing in a muddy creek which had a deep hole in it, and in this hole the coopers had sunk a pile of green hickory hoop poles to soak, some twelve feet under water. We were diving and seeing who could stay under longest. We managed to remain down by holding on to the hoop poles. Dutchy made such a poor success of it that he was hailed with laughter and derision every time his head appeared above water. At last he seemed hurt with the taunts, and begged us to stand still on the bank and be fair with him and give him an honest count be friendly and kind just this once, and not miscount for the sake of having the fun of laughing at him. Treacherous winks were exchanged, and all said all right, Dutchy G.O. ahead, we'll play fair. Dutchy plunged in, but the boys, instead of beginning to count, followed the lead of one of their number and scampered to a range of blackberry bushes close by and hid behind it. They imagined Dutchy's humiliation, when he should rise after a superhuman effort and find the place silent and vacant, nobody there to applaud. They were so full of laugh with the idea, that they were continually exploding into muffled cackles. Time swept on, and presently one who was peeping through the briars, said, with surprise. Why? he hasn't come up, yet. The laughing stopped. Boys, it s a splendid dive, said one. Never mind that, said another, the joke on him is all the better for it. There was a remark or two more, and then a pause. Talking ceased, and all began to peer through the vines. Before long, the boys' faces began to look uneasy, then anxious, then terrified. Still there was no movement of the placid water. Hearts began to beat fast, and faces to turn pale. We all glided out, silently, and stood on the bank, our horrified eyes wandering back and forth from each other's countenances to the water. Somebody must go down and see. Yes, that was plain, but nobody wanted that grisly task. Draw straws. So we did with hands which shook so that we hardly knew what we were about. The lot fell to me, and I went down. The water was so muddy. I could not see anything, but I felt around among the hoop poles, and presently grasped a limp wrist which gave me no response and if it had I should not have known it, I let it go with such a frightened suddenness. The boy had been caught among the hoop poles and entangled there, helplessly. I fled to the surface and told the awful news. Some of us knew that if the boy were dragged out at once he might possibly be resuscitated, but we never thought of that. We did not think of anything, we did not know what to do, so we did nothing except that the smaller lads cried, piteously, and we all struggled frantically into our clothes, putting on any bodies that came handy, and getting them wrong side out and upside down, as a rule. Then we scurried away and gave the alarm, but none of us went back to see the end of the tragedy. We had a more important thing to attend to, we all flew home, and lost not a moment in getting ready to lead a better life. The night presently closed down. 
then came on that tremendous and utterly unaccountable storm. I was perfectly dazed, I could not understand it. It seemed to me that there must be some mistake. The elements were turned loose, and they rattled and banged and blazed away in the most blind and frantic manner. All heart and hope went out of me, and the dismal thought kept floating through my brain, if a boy who knows 3,000 verses by heart is not satisfactory, what chance is there for anybody else? Of course I never questioned for a moment that the storm was on Dutchie's account, or that he or any other inconsequential animal was worthy of such a majestic demonstration from on high, the lesson of it was the only thing that troubled me, for it convinced me that if Dutchie, with all his perfections, was not a delight, it would be vain for me to turn over a new leaf, for I must infallibly fall hopelessly short of that boy, no matter how hard I might try. Nevertheless I did turn it over a highly educated fear compelled me to do that but succeeding days of cheerfulness and sunshine came bothering around, and within a month I had so drifted backward that again I was as lost and comfortable as ever. Breakfast time approached while I mused these musings and called these ancient happenings back to mind, so I got me back into the present and went down the hill. On my way through town to the hotel, I saw the house which was my home when I was a boy. At present rates, the people who now occupy it are of no more value than I am, but in my time they would have been worth not less than $500 apiece. They are colored folk. After breakfast, I went out alone again, intending to hunt up some of the Sunday schools and see how this generation of pupils might compare with their progenitors who had sat with me in those places and had probably taken me as a model though I do not remember as to that now. By the public square there had been in my day a shabby little brick church called the Old Ship of Zion, which I had attended as a Sunday school scholar, and I found the locality easily enough, but not the old church, it was gone, and a trig and rather hilarious new edifice was in its place. The pupils were better dressed and better looking than were those of my time, consequently they did not resemble their ancestors, and consequently there was nothing familiar to me in their faces. Still. I contemplated them with a deep interest and a yearning wistfulness, and if I had been a girl I would have cried, for they were the offspring, and represented, and occupied the places, of boys and girls some of whom I had loved to love, and some of whom I had loved to hate, but all of whom were dear to me for the one reason or the other, so many years gone by and, Lord, where be they now? I was mightily stirred, and would have been grateful to be allowed to remain unmolested and look my fill but a bald summit superintendent who had been a tow-headed Sunday school mate of mine on that spot in the early ages, recognized me, and I talked a flutter of wild nonsense to those children to hide the thoughts which were in me, and which could not have been spoken without a betrayal of feeling that would have been recognized as out of character with me. Making speeches without preparation is no gift of mine, and I was resolved to shirk any new opportunity, but in the next and larger Sunday school I found myself in the rear of the assemblage, so I was very willing to go on the platform a moment for the sake of getting a good look at the scholars. On the spur of the moment I could not recall any of the old idiotic talks which visitors used to insult me with when I was a pupil there, and I was sorry for this, since it would have given me time and excuse to dawdle there and take a long and satisfying look at what I feel at liberty to say was an array of fresh young comeliness not matchable in another Sunday school of the same size. As I talked merely to get a chance to inspect, and as I strung out the random rubbish solely to prolong the inspection, I judged it but decent to confess these low motives, and I did so. If the model boy was in either of these Sunday schools, I did not see him. The model boy of my time we never had but the one W as perfect, perfect in manners, perfect in dress, perfect in conduct, perfect in filial piety, perfect in exterior godliness, but at bottom he was a prig, and as for the contents of his skull, they could have changed place with the contents of a pie and nobody would have been the worse off for it but the pie. This fellow's reproachlessness was a standing reproach to every lad in the village. He was the admiration of all the mothers, and the detestation of all their sons. I was told what became of him, but as it was a disappointment to me, I will not enter into details. He succeeded in life. A vendetta and other things. During my three days' stay in the town, 
I woke up every morning with the impression that I was a boy for in my dreams the faces were all young again, and looked as they had looked in the old times but I went to bed a hundred years old, every night for meantime I had been seeing those faces as they are now. Of course I suffered some surprises, along at first, before I had become adjusted to the changed state of things. I met young ladies who did not seem to have changed at all, but they turned out to be the daughters of the young ladies I had in mind sometimes their granddaughters. When you are told that a stranger of fifty is a grandmother, there is nothing surprising about it, but if, on the contrary, she is a person whom you knew as a little girl, it seems impossible. You say to yourself, how can a little girl be a grandmother? It takes some little time to accept and realize the fact that while you have been growing old, your friends have not been standing still, in that matter. I noticed that the greatest changes observable were with the women, not the men. I saw men whom thirty years had changed but slightly, but their wives had grown old. These were good women, it is very wearing to be good. There was a saddler whom I wished to see, but he was gone. Dead, these many years, they said. Once or twice a day, the saddler used to go tearing down the street, putting on his coat as he went, and then everybody knew a steamboat was coming. Everybody knew, also, that John Stavely was not expecting anybody by the boat or any freight, either, and Stavely must have known that everybody knew this, still it made no difference to him, he liked to seem to himself to be expecting a hundred thousand tons of saddles by this boat, and so he went on all his life, enjoying being faithfully on hand to receive and recede for those saddles, in case by any miracle they should come. A malicious Quincy paper used always to refer to this town, in derision as Stavely's Landing. Stavely was one of my earliest admirations, I envied him his rush of imaginary business, and the display he was able to make of it, before strangers, as he went flying down the street struggling with his fluttering coat. But there was a carpenter who was my chiefest hero. He was a mighty liar, but I did not know that, I believed everything he said. He was a romantic, sentimental, melodramatic fraud, and his bearing impressed me with awe. I vividly remember the first time he took me into his confidence. He was planing a board, and every now and then he would pause and heave a deep sigh, and occasionally mutter broken sentences confused and not intelligible but out of their midst an ejaculation sometimes escaped which made me shiver and did me good, one was, oh God, it is his blood. I sat on the tool chest and humbly and shudderingly admired him, for I judged. He was full of crime. At last he said in a low voice my little friend, can you keep a secret? I eagerly said I could. A dark and dreadful one. I satisfied him on that point. Then I will tell you some passages in my history, for oh, I must relieve my burdened soul, or I shall die. He cautioned me once more to be as silent as the grave, then he told me he was a red-handed murderer. He put down his plane, held his hands out before him, contemplated them sadly, and said. Look with these hands I have taken the lives of thirty human beings. The effect which this had upon me was an inspiration to him, and he turned himself loose upon his subject with interest and energy. He left generalizing, and went into details began with his first murder, described it, told what measures he had taken to avert suspicion, then passed to his second homicide, his third, his fourth, and so on. He had always done his murders with a bowie knife, and he made all my hairs rise by suddenly snatching it out and showing it to me. At the end of this first seance I went home with six of his fearful secrets among my freightage, and found them a great help to my dreams, which had been sluggish for a while back. I sought him again and again, on my Saturday holidays, in fact I spent the summer with him all of it which was valuable to me. His fascinations never diminished, for he threw something fresh and stirring, in the way of horror, into each successive murder. He always gave names, dates, places everything. This by and by enabled me to know two things, that he had killed his victims in every quarter of the globe, and that these victims were always named Lynch. The destruction of the Lynches went serenely on, Saturday after Saturday, 
until the original 30 had multiplied to 60 and more to be heard from yet, then my curiosity got the better of my timidity, and I asked how it happened that these justly punished persons all bore the same name. My hero said he had never divulged that dark secret to any living being, but felt that he could trust me, and therefore he would lay bare before me the story of his sad and blighted life. He had loved one too fair for earth, and she had reciprocated with all the sweet affection of her pure and noble nature. But he had a rival, a base hireling named Archibald Lynch, who said the girl should be his, or he would dye his hands in her heart's best blood. The carpenter, innocent and happy in love's young dream, gave no weight to the threat, but led his golden-haired darling to the altar, and there, the two were made one, there also, just as the minister's hands were stretched in blessing over their heads, the fell deed was done with a knife and the bride fell a corpse at her husband's feet. And what did the husband do? He plucked forth that knife, and kneeling by the body of his lost one, swore to consecrate his life to the extermination of all the human scum that bear the hated name of Lynch. That was it. He had been hunting down the lynches and slaughtering them, from that day to this twenty years. He had always used that same consecrated knife, with it he had murdered his long array of lynches, and with it he had left upon the forehead of each victim a peculiar mark across, deeply incised. Said he. The cross of the mysterious avenger is known in Europe, in America, in China, in Siam, in the tropics, in the polar seas, in the deserts of Asia, in all the earth. Wherever in the uttermost parts of the globe, a lynch has penetrated, there has the mysterious cross been seen, and those who have seen it have shuddered and said, it is his mark, he has been here. You have heard of the mysterious avenger look upon him, for before you stands no less a person. But beware breathe not a word to any soul. Be silent, and wait. Some morning this town will flock aghast to view a gory corpse, on its brow will be seen the awful sign, and men will tremble and whisper, he has been here it is the mysterious avenger's mark. You will come here, but I shall have vanished, you will see me no more. This ass had been reading the Gibbonanacy, no doubt, and had had his poor romantic head turned by it, but as I had not yet seen the book then, I took his inventions for truth, and did not suspect that he was a plagiarist. However, we had a lynch living in the town, and the more I reflected upon his impending doom, the more I could not sleep. It seemed my plain duty to save him, and a still plainer and more important duty to get some sleep for myself, so at last I ventured to go to Mr. Lynch and tell him what was about to happen to him you enter strict secrecy. I advised him to fly, and certainly expected him to do it. But he laughed at me, and he did not stop there, he led me down to the carpenter's shop, gave the carpenter a jeering and scornful lecture upon his silly pretensions, slapped his face, made him get down on his knees and beg then went off and left me to contemplate the cheap and pitiful ruin of what, in my eyes, had so lately been a majestic and incomparable hero. The carpenter blustered, flourished his knife, and doomed this lynch in his usual volcanic style, the size of his fateful words undiminished, but it was all wasted upon me, he was a hero to me no longer, but only a poor, foolish, exposed humbug. I was ashamed of him, and ashamed of myself, I took no further interest in him, and never went to his shop any more. He was a heavy loss to me, for he was the greatest hero I had ever known. The fellow must have had some talent, for some of his imaginary murders were so vividly and dramatically described that I remember all their details yet. The people of Hannibal are not more changed than is the town. It is no longer a village, it is a city, with a mayor, and a council, and waterworks, and probably a debt. It has 15,000 people, is a thriving and energetic place, and is paved like the rest of the west and south where a well-paved street and a good sidewalk are things so seldom seen, that one doubts them when he does see them. The customary half-dozen railway center in Hannibal now, and there is a new depot which cost a hundred thousand dollars. In my time the town had no specialty, and no commercial grandeur, the daily packet usually landed a passenger and bought a catfish, and took away another passenger and a hatful of freight, 
but now a huge commerce in lumber has grown up and a large miscellaneous commerce is one of the results. A deal of money changes hands there now. Bear Creek so-called, perhaps, because it was always so particularly bare of bears is hidden out of sight now, under islands and continents of piled lumber, and nobody but an expert can find it. I used to get drowned in it every summer regularly, and be drained out, and inflated and set going again by some chance enemy, but not enough of it is unoccupied now to drown a person in. It was a famous breeder of chills and fever in its day. I remember one summer when everybody in town had this disease at once. Many chimneys were shaken down, and all the houses were so racked that the town had to be rebuilt. The chasm or gorge between Lover's Leap and the hill west of it is supposed by scientists to have been caused by glacial action. This is a mistake. There is an interesting cave a mile or two below Hannibal, among the bluffs. I would have liked to revisit it, but had not time. In my time the person who then owned it turned it into a mausoleum for his daughter, aged 14. The body of this poor child was put into a copper cylinder filled with alcohol, and this was suspended in one of the dismal avenues of the cave. The top of the cylinder was removable, and it was said to be a common thing for the baser order of tourists to drag the dead face into view and examine it and comment upon it. A question of law. The slaughterhouse is gone from the mouth of Bear Creek and so is the small jail, or calaboose, which once stood in its neighborhood. A citizen asked, do you remember when Jimmy Finn, the town drunkard, was burned to death in the calaboose? Observe, now, how history becomes defiled, through lapse of time and the help of the bad memories of men. Jimmy Finn was not burned in the calaboose, but died a natural death in a tan vat, of a combination of delirium tremens and spontaneous combustion. When I say natural death, I mean it was a natural death for Jimmy Finn to die. The calaboose victim was not a citizen, he was a poor stranger, a harmless whiskey sodden tramp. I know more about his case than anybody else, I knew too much of it, in that bygone day, to relish speaking of it. That tramp was wandering about the streets one chilly evening, with a pipe in his mouth, and begging for a match, he got neither matches nor courtesy, on the contrary, a troop of bad little boys followed him around and amused themselves with nagging and annoying him. I assisted, but at last, some appeal which the wayfarer made for forbearance, accompanying it with a pathetic reference to his forlorn and friendless condition, touched such sense of shame and remnant of right feeling as were left in me, and I went away and got him some matches, and then hied me home and to bed, heavily weighted as to conscience, and unbuoyant in spirit. An hour or two afterward, the man was arrested and locked up in the calaboose by the marshal large name for a constable, but that was his title. At two in the morning, the church bells rang for fire, and everybody turned out, of course I with the rest. The tramp had used his matches disastrously, he had set his straw bed on fire, and the oaken sheathing of the room had caught. When I reached the ground, two hundred men, women, and children stood massed together, transfixed with horror, and staring at the grated windows of the jail. Behind the iron bars, and tugging frantically at them, and screaming for help, stood the tramp, he seemed like a black object set against a sun, so white and intense was the light at his back. That marshal could not be found, and he had the only key. A battering ram was quickly improvised, and the thunder of its blows upon the door had so encouraging a sound that the spectators broke into wild cheering, and believed the merciful battle won. But it was not so. The timbers were too strong, they did not yield. It was said that the man's death grip still held fast to the bars after he was dead, and that in this position the fires wrapped him about and consumed him. As to this, I do not know. What was seen after I recognized the face that was pleading through the bars was seen by others, not by me. I saw that face, so situated, every night for a long time afterward, and I believed myself as guilty of the man's death as if I had given him the matches purposely that he might burn himself up with them. I had not a doubt that I should be hanged if my connection with this tragedy were found out. The happenings and the impressions of that time are burned into my memory, 
and the study of them entertains me as much now as they themselves distressed me then. If anybody spoke of that grisly matter, I was all ears in a moment, and alert to hear what might be said, for I was always dreading and expecting to find out that I was suspected, and so fine and so delicate was the perception of my guilty conscience, that it often detected suspicion in the most purposeless remarks, and in looks, gestures, glances of the eye which had no significance, but which sent me shivering away in a panic of fright, just the same. And how sick it made me when somebody dropped, howsoever carelessly and barren of intent, the remark that murder will out. For a boy of ten years, I was carrying a pretty weighty cargo. All this time I was blessedly forgetting one thing t he fact that I was an inveterate talker in my sleep. But one night I awoke and found my bedmate my younger brother sitting up in bed and contemplating me by the light of the moon. I said. What is the matter? You talk so much I can't sleep. I came to a sitting posture in an instant, with my kidneys in my throat and my hair on end. What did I say? Quick out with it what did I say? Nothing much. It's a lie you know everything. Everything about what? You know well enough. About that. About what, I don't know what you are talking about. I think you are sick or crazy or something. But anyway, you're awake, and I'll get to sleep while I've got a chance. He fell asleep and I lay there in a cold sweat, turning this new terror over in the whirling chaos which did duty as my mind. The burden of my thought was, how much did I divulge? How much does he know, what a distress is this uncertainty? But by and by I evolved an idea I would wake my brother and probe him with a suppositious case. I shook him up, and said. Suppose a man should come to you drunk. This is foolish I never get drunk. I don't mean you, idiot I mean the man. Suppose a man should come to you drunk, and borrow a knife or a tomahawk, or a pistol, and you forgot to tell him it was loaded, and. How could you load a tomahawk? I don't mean the tomahawk, and I didn't say the tomahawk, I said the pistol. Now don't you keep breaking in that way, because this is serious. There's been a man killed. What, in this town? Yes, in this town. Well, go on I won't say a single word. Well. Then, suppose you forgot to tell him to be careful with it, because it was loaded, and he went off and shot himself with that pistol fooling with it, you know, and probably doing it by accident, being drunk. Well, would it be murder? No suicide. No, no. I don't mean his act, I mean yours, would you be a murderer for letting him have that pistol? After deep thought came this answer. Well. I should think I was guilty of something maybe murder yes, probably murder, but I don't quite know. This made me very uncomfortable. However, it was not a decisive verdict. I should have to set out the real case there seemed to be no other way. But I would do it cautiously, and keep a watch out for suspicious effects. I said. I was supposing a case, but I am coming to the real one now. Do you know how the man came to be burned up in the calaboose? No. Haven't you the least idea? Not the least. Wish you may die in your tracks if you have. Yes, wish I may die in my tracks. Well, the way of it was this. The man wanted some matches to light his pipe. A boy got him some. The man set fire to the calaboose with those very matches, and burned himself up. Is that so? Yes, it is. Now, is that boy a murderer, do you think? Let me see. The man was drunk. Yes, he was drunk. Very drunk. Yes. And the boy knew it? Yes, he knew it. There was a long pause. Then came this heavy verdict. If the man was drunk, and the boy knew it, the boy murdered that man. This is certain. Faint, sickening sensations crept along all the fibers of my body, and I seemed to know how a person feels who hears his death sentence pronounced from the bench. I waited to hear what my brother would say next. I believed I knew what it would be, 
and I was right. He said. I know the boy. I had nothing to say, so I said nothing. I simply shuddered. Then he added. Yes, before you got half through telling about the thing, I knew perfectly well who the boy was, it was Ben Kuntz. I came out of my collapse as one who rises from the dead. I said, with admiration. Why, how in the world did you ever guess it? You told it in your sleep. I said to myself, how splendid that is. This is a habit which must be cultivated. My brother rattled innocently on. When you were talking in your sleep, you kept mumbling something about matches, which I couldn't make anything out of, but just now, when you began to tell me about the man and the calaboose and the matches, I remembered that in your sleep you mentioned Ben Koontz two or three times, so I put this and that together, you see, and right away I knew it was Ben that burnt that man up. I praised his sagacity effusively. Presently he asked are you going to give him up to the law? No, I said, I believe that this will be a lesson to him. I shall keep an eye on him, of course, for that is but right, but if he stops where he is and reforms, it shall never be said that I betrayed him. How good you are! Well, I try to be. It is all a person can do in a world like this. And now, my burden being shifted to other shoulders, my terrors soon faded away. The day before we left Hannibal, a curious thing fell under my notice the surprising spread which longitudinal time undergoes there. I learned it from one of the most unostentatious of men the colored coachman of a friend of mine, who lives three miles from town. He was to call for me at the Park Hotel at 7.30 p.m., and drive me out. But he missed it considerably did not arrive till 10. He excused himself by saying. The time is mo's an hour and a half slower in the country and what it is in the town, you'll be in plenty time, boss. Sometimes we shoves out early for church, Sunday, and fetches up da right plum in the middle er de sermon. De funes in de time. A body can't make no calculations about it. I had lost two hours and a half, but I had learned a fact worth four. Chapter. An Archangel. From St. Lewis northward there are all the enlivening signs of the presence of active, energetic, intelligent, prosperous, practical 19th century populations. The people don't dream, they work. The happy result is manifest all around in the substantial outside aspect of things, and the suggestions of wholesome life and comfort that everywhere appear. Quincy is a notable example of brisk, handsome, well-ordered city, and now, as formerly, interested in art, letters, and other high things. But Marion City is an exception. Marion City has gone backwards in a most unaccountable way. This metropolis promised so well that the projectors tacked city to its name in the very beginning, with full confidence, but it was bad prophecy. When I first saw Marion City, 35 years ago, it contained one street, and nearly or quite six houses. It contains but one house now, and this one, in a state of ruin, is getting ready to follow the former five into the river. Doubtless Marion City was too near to Quincy. It had another disadvantage, it was situated in a flat mud bottom, below high water mark, whereas Quincy stands high up on the slope of a hill. In the beginning Quincy had the aspect and ways of a model New England town, and these she has yet, broad, clean streets, trim, neat dwellings and lawns, fine mansions, stately blocks of commercial buildings. And there are ample fairgrounds, a well-kept park, and many attractive drives, library, reading rooms, a couple of colleges, some handsome and costly churches, and a grand courthouse, with grounds which occupy a square. The population of the city is 30,000. There are some large factories here, and manufacturing, of many sorts, is done on a great scale. Lagrange and Canton are growing towns, but I missed Alexandria, was told it was under water, but would come up to blow in the summer. Keokuk was easily recognizable. I lived there in 1857 an extraordinary year there in real estate matters. The boom was something wonderful. Everybody bought, 
everybody sold except widows and preachers, they always hold on, and when the tide ebbs, they get left. Anything in the semblance of a town lot, no matter how situated, was saleable, and at a figure which would still have been high if the ground had been sodded with green backs. The town has a population of 15,000 now, and is progressing with a healthy growth. It was night, and we could not see details, for which we were sorry, for Keokuk has the reputation of being a beautiful city. It was a pleasant one to live in long ago, and doubtless has advanced, not retrograde, in that respect. A mighty work which was in progress there in my day is finished now. This is the canal over the rapids. It is eight miles long, 300 feet wide, and is in no place less than six feet deep. Its masonry is of the majestic kind which the War Department usually deals in, and will endure like a Roman aqueduct. The work cost four or five millions. After an hour or two spent with former friends, we started up the river again. Keokuk, a long time ago, was an occasional loafing place of that erratic genius, Henry Clay Dean. I believe I never saw him but once, but he was much talked of when I lived there. This is what was said of him. He began life poor and without education. But he educated himself on the curbstones of Keokuk. He would sit down on a curbstone with his book, careless or unconscious of the clatter of commerce and the tramp of the passing crowds, and bury himself in his studies by the hour, never changing his position except to draw in his knees now and then to let a dray pass unobstructed, and when his book was finished, its contents, however abstruse, had been burned into his memory, and were his permanent possession. In this way he acquired a vast hoard of all sorts of learning, and had it pigeonholed in his head where he could put his intellectual hand on it whenever it was wanted. His clothes differed in no respect from a war frats, except that they were raggedier, more ill-assorted and inharmonious, and therefore more extravagantly picturesque, and several layers dirtier. Nobody could infer the mastermind in the top of that edifice from the edifice itself. He was an orator by nature in the first place, and later by the training of experience and practice. When he was out on a canvas, his name was a lodestone which drew the farmers to his stump from fifty miles around. His theme was always politics. He used no notes, for a volcano does not need notes. In 1862, a son of Keokuk's late distinguished citizen, Mr. Claggett, gave me this incident concerning Dean. The war feeling was running high in Keokuk, in 61, and a great mass meeting was to be held on a certain day in the new Athenaeum. A distinguished stranger was to address the house. After the building had been packed to its utmost capacity with sweltering folk of both sexes, the stage still remained vacant the distinguished stranger had failed to connect. The crowd grew impatient, and by and by indignant and rebellious. About this time a distressed manager discovered Dean on a curbstone, explained the dilemma to him, took his book away from him, rushed him into the building the back way, and told him to make for the stage and save his country. Presently a sudden silence fell upon the grumbling audience, and everybody's eyes sought a single point the wide, empty, carpetless stage. A figure appeared there whose aspect was familiar to hardly a dozen persons present. It was the scarecrow Dean in foxy shoes, down at the heels, socks of odd colors, also down, damaged trousers, relics of antiquity, and a world too short, exposing some inches of naked ankle, an unbuttoned vest, also too short, and exposing a zone of soiled and wrinkled linen between it and the waistband, shirt bosom open, long black handkerchief, wound round and round the neck like a bandage, bobtailed blue coat, reaching down to the small of the back, with sleeves which left four inches of forearm unprotected, small, stiff-brimmed soldier cap hung on a corner of the bump of whichever bump it was. This figure moved gravely out upon the stage and, with sedate and measured step, down to the front, where it paused, and dreamily inspected the house, saying no word. The silence of surprise held its own for a moment, then was broken by a just audible ripple of merriment which swept the sea of faces like the wash of a wave. The figure remained as before, thoughtfully inspecting. 
another wave started laughter, this time. It was followed by another, then a third this last one boisterous. And now the stranger stepped back one pace, took off his soldier cap, tossed it into the wing, and began to speak, with deliberation, nobody listening, everybody laughing and whispering. The speaker talked on unembarrassed, and presently delivered a shot which went home, and silence and attention resulted. He followed it quick and fast, with other telling things, warmed to his work and began to pour his words out, instead of dripping them, grew hotter and hotter, and fell to discharging lightnings and thunder and now the house began to break into applause, to which the speaker gave no heed, but went hammering straight on, unwound his black bandage and cast it away, still thundering, presently discarded the bob-tailed coat and flung it aside, firing up higher and higher all the time, finally. Flung the vest after the coat, and then for an untimed period stood there, like another Vesuvius, spouting smoke and flame, lava and ashes, raining pumice stone and cinders, shaking the moral earth with intellectual crash upon crash, explosion upon explosion, while the mad multitude stood upon their feet in a solid body, answering back with a ceaseless hurricane of cheers, through a thrashing snowstorm of waving handkerchiefs. When Dean came, said Claggett, the people thought he was an escaped lunatic, but when he went, they thought he was an escaped archangel. Burlington, home of the sparkling Burdett, is another hill city, and also a beautiful one, unquestionably so, a fine and flourishing city, with a population of 25,000, and belted with busy factories of nearly every imaginable description. It was a very sober city, too for the moment for a most sobering bill was pending, a bill to forbid the manufacture, exportation, importation, purchase, sale, borrowing, lending, stealing, drinking, smelling, or possession, by conquest, inheritance, intent, accident, or otherwise, in the state of Iowa, of each and every deleterious beverage known to the human race, except water. This measure was approved by all the rational people in the state, but not by the bench of judges. Burlington has the progressive modern city's full equipment of devices for right and intelligent government, including a paid fire department, a thing which the great city of New Orleans is without, but still employs that relic of antiquity, the independent system. In Burlington, as in all these upper river towns, one breathes a go-ahead atmosphere which tastes good in the nostrils. An opera house has lately been built there which is in strong contrast with the shabby dens which usually do duty as theatres in cities of Burlington's size. We had not time to go ashore in Muscatine, but had a daylight view of it from the boat. I lived there a while, many years ago, but the place, now, had a rather unfamiliar look, so I suppose it has clear outgrown the town which I used to know. In fact, I know it has, for I remember it as a small place which it isn't now. But I remember it best for a lunatic who caught me out in the fields, one Sunday, and extracted a butcher knife from his boot and proposed to carve me up with it, unless I acknowledged him to be the only son of the devil. I tried to compromise on an acknowledgement that he was the only member of the family I had met, but that did not satisfy him, he wouldn't have any half measures, I must say he was the sole and only son of the devil he wetted his knife on his boot. It did not seem worthwhile to make trouble about a little thing like that, so I swung round to his view of the matter and saved my skin whole. Shortly afterward, he went to visit his father, and as he has not turned up since, I trust he is there yet. And I remember Muscatine still more pleasantly for its summer sunsets. I have never seen any, on either side of the ocean, that equaled them. They used the broad smooth river as a canvas, and painted on it every imaginable dream of color, from the mottled daintinesses and delicacies of the opal, all the way up, through cumulative intensities, to blinding purple and crimson conflagrations which were enchanting to the eye, but sharply tried it at the same time. All the upper Mississippi region has these extraordinary sunsets as a familiar spectacle. It is the true sunset land, I am sure no other country can show so good a right to the name. The sunrises are also said to be exceedingly fine. I do not know. On the upper river. The big towns drop in, 
thick and fast, now and between stretch processions of thrifty farms, not desolate solitude. Hour by hour, the boat plows deeper and deeper into the great and populous northwest, and with each successive section of it which is revealed, one surprise and respect gather emphasis and increase. Such a people, and such achievements as theirs, compel homage. This is an independent race who think for themselves, and who are competent to do it, because they are educated and enlightened, they read, they keep abreast of the best and newest thought, they fortify every weak place in their land with a school, a college, a library, and a newspaper, and they live under law. Solicitude for the future of a race like this is not in order. This region is new, so new that it may be said to be still in its babyhood. By what it has accomplished while still teething, one may forecast what marvels it will do in the strength of its maturity. It is so new that the foreign tourist has not heard of it yet, and has not visited it. For sixty years, the foreign tourist has steamed up and down the river between St. Louis and New Orleans, and then gone home and written his book, believing he had seen all of the river that was worth seeing or that had anything to see. In not six of all these books is there mention of these upper river towns for the reason that the five or six tourists who penetrated this region did it before these towns were projected. The latest tourist of them all, 1878, made the same old regulation trip he had not heard that there was anything north of St. Louis. Yet there was. There was this amazing region, bristling with great towns, projected day before yesterday, so to speak, and built next morning. A score of them number from 1,500 to 5,000 people. Then we have Muscatine, 10,000, Winona, 10,000, Molin, 10,000, Rock Island, 12,000, La Crosse, 12,000, Burlington, 25,000, Dubuque, 25,000, Davenport, 30,000, St. Paul, 58,000, Minneapolis, 60,000 and upward. The foreign tourist has never heard of these, there is no note of them in his books. They have sprung up in the night, while he slept. So new is this region, that I, who am comparatively young, am yet older than it is. When I was born, St. Paul had a population of three persons, Minneapolis had just a third as many. The then population of Minneapolis died two years ago, and when he died he had seen himself undergo an increase, in forty years, of 59,999 persons. He had a frog's fertility. I must explain that the figures set down above, as the population of St. Paul and Minneapolis, are several months old. These towns are far larger now. In fact, I have just seen a newspaper estimate which gives the former 71,000, and the latter 78,000. This book will not reach the public for six or seven months yet, none of the figures will be worth much then. We had a glimpse of Davenport, which is another beautiful city, crowning a hill a phrase which applies to all these towns, for they are all comely, all well built, clean, orderly, pleasant to the eye, and cheering to the spirit, and they are all situated upon hills. Therefore we will give that phrase a rest. The Indians have a tradition that Marquette and Joliet camped where Davenport now stands, in 1673. The next white man who camped there, did it about 170 years later in 1834. Davenport has gathered its 30,000 people within the past 30 years. She sends more children to her schools now, than her whole population numbered 23 years ago. She has the usual upper river quota of factories, newspapers, and institutions of learning, she has telephones, local telegraphs, an electric alarm, and an admirable paid fire department, consisting of six hook and ladder companies, four steam fire engines, and thirty churches. Davenport is the official residence of two bishops Episcopal and Catholic. Opposite Davenport is the flourishing town of Rock Island, which lies at the foot of the Upper Rapids. A great railroad bridge connects the two towns one of the thirteen which fret the Mississippi and the pilots, between St. Louis and St. Paul.
The charming island of Rock Island, three miles long and half a mile wide, belongs to the United States, and the government has turned it into a wonderful park, enhancing its natural attractions by art, and threading its fine forests with many miles of drives. Near the center of the island one catches glimpses, through the trees, of ten vast stone four-story buildings, each of which covers an acre of ground. These are the government workshops, for the Rock Island establishment is a national armory and arsenal. We move up the river always through enchanting scenery, there being no other kind on the upper Mississippi and Pass Molin, a center of vast manufacturing industries, and Clinton and Lyons, great lumber centers, and presently reach Dubuque, which is situated in a rich mineral region. The lead mines are very productive, and of wide extent. Dubuque has a great number of manufacturing establishments, among them a plow factory which has for customers all Christendom in general. At least so I was told by an agent of the concern who was on the boat. He said. You show me any country under the sun where they really know how to plow, and if I don't show you our mark on the plow they use, I'll eat that plow, and I won't ask for any Worcestershire sauce to flavor it up with, either. All this part of the river is rich in Indian history and traditions. Black Hawks was once a puissant name hereabouts, as was Keokuk, further down. A few miles below Dubuque is the Tete de Mort Deathus Head Rock, or bluff to the top of which the French drove a band of Indians, in early times, and cooped them up there, with death for a certainty, and only the manner of it matter of choice to starve, or jump off and kill themselves. Black Hawk adopted the ways of the white people, toward the end of his life, and when he died he was buried, near Des Moines, in Christian fashion, modified by Indian custom, that is to say, clothed in a Christian military uniform, and with a Christian cane in his hand, but deposited in the grave in a sitting posture. Formerly, a horse had always been buried with a chief. The substitution of the cane shows that Black Hawk's haughty nature was really humbled, and he expected to walk when he got over. We noticed that above Dubuque the water of the Mississippi was olive green rich and beautiful and semi-transparent, with the sun on it. Of course the water was nowhere as clear or of as fine a complexion as it is in some other seasons of the year, for now it was at flood stage, and therefore dimmed and blurred by the mud manufactured from caving banks. The majestic bluffs that overlook the river, along through this region, charm one with the grace and variety of their forms, and the soft beauty of their adornment. The steep verdant slope, whose base is at the water's edge is topped by a lofty rampart of broken, turreted rocks, which are exquisitely rich and mellow in color mainly dark browns and dull greens, but splashed with other tints. And then you have the shining river, winding here and there and yonder, its sweep interrupted at intervals by clusters of wooded islands threaded by silver channels, and you have glimpses of distant villages, asleep upon capes, and of stealthy rafts slipping along in the shade of the forest walls, and of white steamers vanishing around remote points and it is all as tranquil and reposeful as dreamland, and has nothing this worldly about it nothing to hang a fret or a worry upon. Until the unholy train comes tearing along which it presently does, ripping the sacred solitude to rags and tatters with its devil's whoop and the roar and thunder of its rushing wheels and straightway you are back in this world, and with one of its frets ready to hand for your entertainment, for you remember that this is the very road whose stock always goes down after you buy it, and always goes up again as soon as you sell it. It makes me shudder to this day, to remember that I once came near not getting rid of my stock at all. It must be an awful thing to have a railroad left on your hands. The locomotive is in sight from the deck of the steamboat almost the whole way from St. Louis to St. Paul 800 miles. These railroads have made havoc with the steamboat commerce. The clerk of our boat was a steamboat clerk before these roads were built. In that day the influx of population was so great, and the freight business so heavy, that the boats were not able to keep up with the demands made upon their carrying capacity, consequently the captains were very independent and airy pretty bigoty, as Uncle Remus would say. The clerk nutshelled the contrast between the former time and the present, thus. Boat used to land sea afton on hurricane roof mighty stiff and straight iron ramrod for a spine kid gloves, 
plug tile, hair parted behind man on shore takes off hat and says. Got 28 tons of wheat, Captain B.E. Great favor if you can take them. Captain says. LL take two of them and don't even condescend to look at him. But nowadays the captain takes off his old slouch, and smiles all the way around to the back of his ears, and gets off a bow which he hasn't got any ramrod to interfere with, and says. Glad to see you, Smith, glad to see you why oh you re looking well haven't seen you looking so well for years what you got for us. Nothing, says Smith, and keeps his hat on, and just turns his back and goes to talking with somebody else. Oh, yes, eight years ago, the captain was on top, but it's Smith's turn now. Eight years ago a boat used to go up the river with every stateroom full, and people piled five and six deep on the cabin floor, and a solid deck load of immigrants and harvesters down below, into the bargain. To get a first-class stateroom, you'd got to prove sixteen quarterings of nobility and four hundred years of descent, or be personally acquainted with the nigger that blacked the captain's boots. But it's all changed now, plenty staterooms above, no harvesters below there's a patent self-binder now, and they don't have harvesters anymore, they've gone where the woodbine twineth and they didn't go by steamboat, either, went by the train. Up in this region we met massed acres of lumber rafts coming down but not floating leisurely along, in the old-fashioned way, manned with joyous and reckless crews of fiddling, song singing, whiskey drinking, breakdown dancing rap scallions, no, the whole thing was shoved swiftly along by a powerful stern wheeler, modern fashion, and the small crews were quiet, orderly men, of a sedate business aspect, with not a suggestion of romance about them anywhere. Along here, somewhere, on a black night, we ran some exceedingly narrow and intricate island chutes by aid of the electric light. Behind was solid blackness a crackless bank of it, ahead, a narrow elbow of water, curving between dense walls of foliage that almost touched our bows on both sides, and here every individual leaf, and every individual ripple stood out in its natural color, and flooded with a glare as of noonday intensified. The effect was strange, and fine, and very striking. We passed Prairie du Chien, another of Father Marquette's camping places, and after some hours of progress through varied and beautiful scenery, reached La Crosse. Here is a town of 12 or 13,000 population, with electric lighted streets, and with blocks of buildings which are stately enough, and also architecturally fine enough, to command respect in any city. It is a choice town, and we made satisfactory use of the hour allowed us, in roaming it over, though the weather was rainier than necessary. Legends and Scenery We added several passengers to our list, at La Crosse, among others an old gentleman who had come to this northwestern region with the early settlers, and was familiar with every part of it. Pardonably proud of it, too. He said. You'll find scenery between here and St. Paul that can give the Hudson points. You'll have the Queen's Bluff 700 feet high, and just as imposing a spectacle as you can find anywheres, and Trampolo Island, which isn't like any other island in America. I believe, for it is a gigantic mountain, with precipitous sides, and is full of Indian traditions, and used to be full of rattlesnakes, if you catch the sun just right there, you will have a picture that will stay with you. And above Winona you'll have lovely prairies, and then come the thousand islands, too beautiful for anything, green. Why you never saw foliage so green, nor pack so thick, it's like a thousand plush cushions afloat on a looking glass when the water is still, and then the monstrous bluffs on both sides of the river ragged, rugged, dark complected just the frame that's wanted, you always want a strong frame, you know, to throw up the nice points of a delicate picture and make them stand out. The old gentleman also told us a touching Indian legend or two but not very powerful ones. After this excursion into history, he came back to the scenery, and described it, detail by detail, from the Thousand Islands to St. Paul, naming its names with such facility, tripping along his theme with such nimble and confident ease, slamming in a three-ton word, here and there, 
with such a complacent air of tisnt anything I can do it any time I want to and letting off fine surprises of lurid eloquence at such judicious intervals, that I presently began to suspect. But no matter what I began to suspect. Hear him. Ten miles above Winona we come to Fountain City, nestling sweetly at the feet of cliffs that lift their awful fronts, Jove-like, toward the blue depths of heaven, bathing them in virgin atmospheres that have known no other contact save that of angels' wings. And next we glide through silver waters, amid lovely and stupendous aspects of nature that attune our hearts to adoring admiration, about twelve miles, and strike Mount Vernon, six hundred feet high, with romantic ruins of a once first-class hotel perched far among the cloud shadows that model its dizzy height sole remnant of once flourishing Mount Vernon, town of early days, now desolate and utterly deserted. And so we move on. Past Chimney Rock we fly noble shaft of six hundred feet, then just before landing at Minieska our attention is attracted by a most striking promontory rising over five hundred feet the ideal mountain pyramid. Its conic shape thickly wooded surface girding its sides, and its apex like that of a cone, cause the spectator to wonder at nature's workings. From its dizzy height superb views of the forests, streams, bluffs, hills, and dales below and beyond for miles are brought within its focus. What grander river scenery can be conceived, as we gaze upon this enchanting landscape, from the uppermost point of these bluffs upon the valleys below? The primeval wildness and awful loneliness of these sublime creations of nature and nature's God, excite feelings of unbounded admiration, and the recollection of which can never be effaced from the memory, as we view them in any direction. Next we have the lion's head and the lioness's head, carved by nature's hand, to adorn and dominate the beauteous stream, and then anon the river widens, and a most charming and magnificent view of the valley before us suddenly bursts upon our vision, rugged hills, clad with verdant forests from summit to base, level prairie lands, holding in their lap the beautiful Wabasha, city of the healing waters, puissant foe of Bright's disease, and that grandest conception of nature's works. Incomparable Lake Pepin these constitute a picture whereon the tourist's eye may gaze uncounted hours, with rapture unappeased and unappeasable. And so we glide along, in due time encountering those majestic domes, the mighty sugar loaf, and the sublime maiden's rock which latter, romantic superstition has invested with a voice, and oft times as the birch canoe glides near, at twilight, the dusky paddler fancies he hears the soft sweet music of the long departed Winona, darling of Indian song and story. Then Frontenac looms upon our vision, delightful resort of jaded summer tourists, then progressive red wing, and diamond bluff, impressive and preponderous in its lone sublimity, then Prescott and the St. Croix, and anon we see bursting upon us the domes and steeples of St. Paul, giant young chief of the north, marching with seven league stride in the van of progress, banner bearer of the highest and newest civilization, carving his beneficent way with the tomahawk of commercial enterprise, sounding the warhoop of Christian culture, tearing off the reeking scalp of sloth and superstition to plant there the steam plow and the schoolhouse ever in his front stretch arid lawlessness, ignorance, crime, despair, ever in his wake bloom the jail, the gallows, and the pulpit, and ever. Have you ever traveled with a panorama? I have formerly served in that capacity. My suspicion was confirmed. Do you still travel with it? No she is laid up till the fall season opens. I am helping now to work up the materials for a tourist's guide which the St. Lewis and St. Paul Packet Company are going to issue this summer for the benefit of travelers who go by that line. When you were talking of Maiden's Rock, you spoke of the long-departed Winona, darling of Indian song and story. Is she the Maiden of the Rock, and are the two connected by legend? Yes and a very tragic and painful one. Perhaps the most celebrated, as well as the most pathetic, of all the legends of the Mississippi. We asked him to tell it. He dropped out of his conversational vein and back into his lecture gate without an effort, and rolled on as follows. A little distance above Lake City is a famous point known as Maiden's Rock, which is not only a picturesque spot, but is full of romantic interest from the event which gave it its name, 
Not many years ago this locality was a favorite resort for the Sioux Indians on account of the fine fishing and hunting to be had there, and large numbers of them were always to be found in this locality. Among the families which used to resort here, was one belonging to the tribe of Wabasha. We know N.A., firstborn, was the name of a maiden who had plighted her troth to a lover belonging to the same band. But her stern parents had promised her hand to another, a famous warrior, and insisted on her wedding him. The day was fixed by her parents, to her great grief. She appeared to accede to the proposal and accompany them to the rock, for the purpose of gathering flowers for the feast. On reaching the rock, we know N.A. ran to its summit and standing on its edge upbraided her parents who were below, for their cruelty, and then singing a death dirge, threw herself from the precipice and dashed them in pieces on the rock below. Dashed who in pieces her parents? Yes. Well, it certainly was a tragic business, as you say. And moreover, there is a startling kind of dramatic surprise about it which I was not looking for. It is a distinct improvement upon the threadbare form of Indian legend. There are fifty lovers leaps along the Mississippi from whose summit disappointed Indian girls have jumped, but this is the only jump in the lot had turned out in the right and satisfactory way. What became of Winona? She was a good deal jarred up and jolted, but she got herself together and disappeared before the coroner reached the fatal spot, and tis said she sought and married her true love, and wandered with him to some distant clime, where she lived happy ever after, her gentle spirit mellowed and chastened by the romantic incident which had so early deprived her of the sweet guidance of a mother's love and a father's protecting arm, and thrown her, all unfriended, upon the cold charity of a censorious world. I was glad to hear the lecturer's description of the scenery, for it assisted my appreciation of what I saw of it, and enabled me to imagine such of it as we lost by the intrusion of night. As the lecturer remarked, this whole region is blanketed with Indian tales and traditions. But I reminded him that people usually merely mention this fact doing it in a way to make a body's mouth water and judiciously stop there. Why? Because the impression left, was that these tales were full of incident and imagination a pleasant impression which would be promptly dissipated if the tales were told. I showed him a lot of this sort of literature which I had been collecting, and he confessed that it was poor stuff, exceedingly sorry rubbish, and I ventured to add that the legends which he had himself told us were of this character, with the single exception of the admirable story of Winona. He granted these facts, but said that if I would hunt up Mr. Schoolcraft's book, published near fifty years ago, and now doubtless out of print, I would find some Indian inventions in it that were very far from being barren of incident and imagination, that the tales in Hiawatha were of this sort, and they came from Schoolcraft's book, and that there were others in the same book which Mr. Longfellow could have turned into verse with good effect. For instance, there was the legend of the undying head. He could not tell it, for many of the details had grown dim in his memory, but he would recommend me to find it and enlarge my respect for the Indian imagination. He said that this tale, and most of the others in the book, were current among the Indians along this part of the Mississippi when he first came here, and that the contributors to Schoolcraft's book had got them directly from Indian lips, and had written them down with strict exactness, and without embellishments of their own. I have found the book. The lecturer was right. There are several legends in it which confirm what he said. I will offer two of them the Undying Head, and Pibon and Sigwun, an allegory of the seasons. The latter is used in Hiawatha, but it is worth reading in the original form, if only that one may see how effective a genuine poem can be without the helps and graces of poetic measure and rhythm Pibon and Sigwun. An old man was sitting alone in his lodge, by the side of a frozen stream. It was the close of winter, and his fire was almost out, he appeared very old and very desolate. His locks were white with age, and he trembled in every joint. Day after day passed in solitude, and he heard nothing but the sound of the tempest, sweeping before it the new fallen snow. One day, as his fire was just dying, a handsome young man approached and entered his dwelling. His cheeks were red with the blood of youth, his eyes sparkled with animation, and a smile played upon his lips. 
he walked with a light and quick step. His forehead was bound with a wreath of sweet grass, in place of a warrior's frontlet, and he carried a bunch of flowers in his hand. Ah, my son, said the old man, I am happy to see you. Come in. Come and tell me of your adventures, and what strange lands you have been to see. Let us pass the night together. I will tell you of my prowess and exploits, and what I can perform. You shall do the same, and we will amuse ourselves. He then drew from his sack a curiously wrought antique pipe, and having filled it with tobacco, rendered mild by a mixture of certain leaves, handed it to his guest. When this ceremony was concluded they began to speak. I blow my breath, said the old man, and the stream stands still. The water becomes stiff and hard as clear stone. I breathe, said the young man, and flowers spring up over the plain. I shake my locks, retorted the old man, and snow covers the land. The leaves fall from the trees at my command, and my breath blows them away. The birds get up from the water, and fly to a distant land. The animals hide themselves from my breath, and the very ground becomes as hard as flint. I shake my ringlets, rejoined the young man, and warm showers of soft rain fall upon the earth. The plants lift up their heads out of the earth, like the eyes of children glistening with delight. My voice recalls the birds. The warmth of my breath unlocks the streams. Music fills the groves wherever I walk, and all nature rejoices. At length the sun began to rise. A gentle warmth came over the place. The tongue of the old man became silent. The robin and bluebird began to sing on the top of the lodge. The stream began to murmur by the door, and the fragrance of growing herbs and flowers came softly on the vernal breeze. Daylight fully revealed to the young man the character of his entertainer. When he looked upon him, he had the icy visage of Peabone. Twenty streams began to flow from his eyes. As the sun increased, he grew less and less in stature, and Anon had melted completely away. Nothing remained on the place of his lodge fire but the miscode 21 a small white flower, with a pink border, which is one of the earliest species of northern plants. The undying head is a rather long tail, but it makes up in weird conceits, fairy tale prodigies, variety of incident, and energy of movement, for what it lacks in brevity. 22. Speculations and Conclusions We reached St. Paul at the head of navigation of the Mississippi, and there our voyage of 2,000 miles from New Orleans ended. It is about a 10-day trip by steamer. It can probably be done quicker by rail. I judge so because I know that one may go by rail from St. Louis to Hannibal a distance of at least 120 miles in 7 hours. This is better than walking, unless one is in a hurry. The season being far advanced when we were in New Orleans, the roses and magnolia blossoms were falling, but here in St. Paul it was the snow, in New Orleans we had caught an occasional withering breath from over a crater, apparently, here in St. Paul we caught a frequent benumbing one from over a glacier, apparently. But I wander from my theme. St. Paul is a wonderful town. It is put together in solid blocks of honest brick and stone, and has the air of intending to stay. Its post office was established 36 years ago, and by and by, when the postmaster received a letter, he carried it to Washington, horseback, to inquire what was to be done with it. Such is the legend. Two frame houses were built that year, and several persons were added to the population. A recent number of the leading St. Paul Paper, the Pioneer Press, gives some statistics which furnish a vivid contrast to that old state of things, to wit, population, autumn of the present year, 1882, 71,000, number of letters handled, first half of the year, 1,209,387, number of houses built during three quarters of the year, 989, their cost, $3,186,000. The increase of letters over the corresponding six months of last year was 
last year the new buildings added to the city cost above $4,500,000. St. Paul's strength lies in her commerce I mean his commerce. He is a manufacturing city, of course all the cities of that region are but he is peculiarly strong in the matter of commerce. Last year his jobbing trade amounted to upwards of $52 million. He has a custom house, and is building a costly capital to replace the one recently burned for he is the capital of the state. He has churches without end, and not the cheap poor kind, but the kind that the rich Protestant puts up, the kind that the poor Irish hired girl delights to erect. What a passion for building majestic churches the Irish hired girl has. It is a fine thing for our architecture but too often we enjoy her stately fanes without giving her a grateful thought. In fact, instead of reflecting that every brick and every stone in this beautiful edifice represents an ache or a pain, and a handful of sweat, and hours of heavy fatigue, contributed by the back and forehead and bones of poverty, it is our habit to forget these things entirely, and merely glorify the mighty temple itself, without vouchsafing one praiseful thought to its humble builder, whose rich heart and withered purse it symbolizes. This is a land of libraries and schools. St. Paul has three public libraries, and they contain, in the aggregate, some 40,000 books. He has 116 schoolhouses, and pays out more than $70,000 a year in teachers' salaries. There is an unusually fine railway station, so large is it, in fact, that it seemed somewhat overdone, in the matter of size, at first, but at the end of a few months it was perceived that the mistake was distinctly the other way. The error is to be corrected. The town stands on high ground, it is about 700 feet above the sea level. It is so high that a wide view of river and lowland is offered from its streets. It is a very wonderful town indeed, and is not finished yet. All the streets are obstructed with building material, and this is being compacted into houses as fast as possible, to make room for more F or other people are anxious to build, as soon as they can get the use of the streets to pile up their bricks and stuff in. How solemn and beautiful is the thought, that the earliest pioneer of civilization, the van leader of civilization, is never the steamboat, never the railroad, never the newspaper, never the Sabbath school, never the missionary but always whiskey. Such is the case. Look history over, you will see. The missionary comes after the whiskey I mean he arrives after the whiskey has arrived, next comes the poor immigrant, with axe and hoe and rifle, next, the trader, next, the miscellaneous rush, next, the gambler, the desperado, the highwayman, and all their kindred in sin of both sexes, and next, the smart chap who has bought up an old grant that covers all the land, this brings the lawyer tribe, the vigilance committee brings the undertaker. All these interests bring the newspaper, the newspaper starts up politics and a railroad, all hands turn to and build a church and a jail and behold, civilization is established forever in the land. But whiskey, you see, was the van leader in this beneficent work. It always is. It was like a foreigner and excusable in a foreigner to be ignorant of this great truth, and wander off into astronomy to borrow a symbol. But if he had been conversant with the facts, he would have said westward the jug of empire takes its way. This great van leader arrived upon the ground which St. Paul now occupies, in June 1837. Yes, at that date, Pierre Parent, a Canadian, built the first cabin, uncorked his jug, and began to sell whiskey to the Indians. The result is before us. All that I have said of the newness, briskness, swift progress, wealth, intelligence, fine and substantial architecture, and general slash and go, and energy of St. Paul, will apply to his near neighbor, Minneapolis with the addition that the latter is the bigger of the two cities. These extraordinary towns were ten miles apart, a few months ago, but were growing so fast that they may possibly be joined now, and getting along under a single mayor. At any rate, within five years from now there will be at least such a substantial ligament of buildings stretching between them and uniting them that a stranger will not be able to tell where the one Siamese twin leaves off and the other begins. 
combined, they will then number a population of 250,000, if they continue to grow as they are now growing. Thus, this center of population at the head of Mississippi navigation, will then begin a rivalry as to numbers, with that center of population at the foot of it New Orleans. Minneapolis is situated at the falls of St. Anthony, which stretch across the river, 1500 feet, and have a fall of 82 feet a water power which, by art, has been made of inestimable value, business-wise, though somewhat to the damage of the falls as a spectacle, or as a background against which to get your photograph taken. 30 flowering mills turn out 2 million barrels of the very choicest of flour every year, 20 sawmills produce 200 million feet of lumber annually, then there are woolen mills, cotton mills, paper and oil mills, and sash, nail, furniture, barrel, and other factories, without number, so to speak. The great flowering mills here and at St. Paul use the new process and mash the wheat by rolling, instead of grinding it. 16 railroads meet in Minneapolis, and 65 passenger trains arrive and depart daily. In this place, as in St. Paul, journalism thrives. Here there are three great dailies, ten weeklies, and three monthlies. There is a university, with 400 students and, better still, its good efforts are not confined to enlightening the one sex. There are 16 public schools, with buildings which cost $500,000, there are 6,000 pupils and 128 teachers. There are also 70 churches existing, and a lot more projected. The banks aggregate a capital of $3 million, and the wholesale jobbing trade of the town amounts to $50 million a year. Near St. Paul and Minneapolis are several points of interest for it. Snelling, a fortress occupying a river bluff a hundred feet high, the falls of Minnehaha, White Bear Lake, and so forth. The beautiful falls of Minnehaha are sufficiently celebrated they do not need a lift from me, in that direction. The White Bear Lake is less known. It is a lovely sheet of water, and is being utilized as a summer resort by the wealth and fashion of the state. It has its clubhouse, and its hotel, with the modern improvements and conveniences, its fine summer residences, and plenty of fishing, hunting, and pleasant drives. There are a dozen minor summer resorts around about St. Paul and Minneapolis, but the White Bear Lake is the resort. Connected with White Bear Lake is a most idiotic Indian legend. I would resist the temptation to print it here, if I could, but the task is beyond my strength. The guidebook names the preserver of the legend, and compliments his facile pen. Without further comment or delay then. Let us turn the said facile pen loose upon the reader a legend of White Bear Lake. Every spring, for perhaps a century, or as long as there has been a nation of red men, an island in the middle of White Bear Lake has been visited by a band of Indians for the purpose of making maple sugar. Tradition says that many springs ago, while upon this island, a young warrior loved and wooed the daughter of his chief, and it is said, also, the maiden loved the warrior. He had again and again been refused her hand by her parents, the old chief alleging that he was no brave, and his old consort called him a woman. The sun had again set upon the sugar bush, and the bright moon rose high in the bright blue heavens, when the young warrior took down his flute and went out alone, once more to sing the story of his love, the mild breeze gently moved the two gay feathers in his head dress, and as he mounted on the trunk of a leaning tree, the damp snow fell from his feet heavily. As he raised his flute to his lips, his blanket slipped from his well-formed shoulders, and lay partly on the snow beneath. He began his weird, wild love song, but soon felt that he was cold, and as he reached back for his blanket, some unseen hand laid it gently on his shoulders, it was the hand of his love, his guardian angel. She took her place beside him, and for the present they were happy, for the Indian has a heart to love, and in this pride he is as noble as in his own freedom, which makes him the child of the forest. As the legend runs, a large white bear, thinking, perhaps, that polar snows and dismal winter weather extended everywhere, took up his journey southward. He at length approached the northern shore of the lake which now bears his name, 
walked down the bank and made his way noiselessly through the deep heavy snow toward the island. It was the same spring and suing that the lovers met. They had left their first retreat, and were now seated among the branches of a large elm which hung far over the lake. The same tree is still standing, and excites universal curiosity and interest. For fear of being detected, they talked almost in a whisper, and now, that they might get back to camp in good time and thereby avoid suspicion, they were just rising to return, when the maiden uttered a shriek which was heard at the camp, and bounding toward the young brave, she caught his blanket, but missed the direction of her foot and fell, bearing the blanket with her into the great arms of the ferocious monster. Instantly every man, woman, and child of the band were upon the bank, but all unarmed. Cries and wailings went up from every mouth. What was to be done? In the meantime this white and savage beast held the breathless maiden in his huge grasp, and fondled with his precious prey as if he were used to scenes like this. One deafening yell from the lover warrior is heard above the cries of hundreds of his tribe, and dashing away to his wigwam he grasps his faithful knife, returns almost at a single bound to the scene of fear and fright, rushes out along the leaning tree to the spot where his treasure fell, and springing with the fury of a mad panther, pounced upon his prey. The animal turned, and with one stroke of his huge paw brought the lover's heart to heart, but the next moment the warrior, with one plunge of the blade of his knife, opened the crimson sluices of death, and the dying bear relaxed his hold. That night there was no more sleep for the band or the lovers, and as the young and the old danced about the carcass of the dead monster, the gallant warrior was presented with another plume, and ere another moon had set he had a living treasure added to his heart. Their children for many years played upon the skin of the white bear from which the lake derives its name and the maiden and the brave remembered long the fearful scene and rescue that made them one, for Kis Se Mipa and Kago Ka could never forget their fearful encounter with the huge monster that came so near sending them to the happy hunting ground. It is a perplexing business. First, she fell down out of the tree she and the blanket, and the bear caught her and fondled her her and the blanket, then she fell up into the tree again leaving the blanket, meantime the lover goes war hooping home and comes back healed, climbs the tree, jumps down on the bear, the girl jumps down after him apparently, for she was up the tree resumes her place in the bear's arms along with the blanket, the lover rams his knife into the bear, and saves whom, the blanket. Know nothing of the sort. You get yourself all worked up and excited about that blanket, and then all of a sudden, just when a happy climax seems imminent you are let down flat nothing saved but the girl. Whereas, one is not interested in the girl, she is not the prominent feature of the legend. Nevertheless, there you are left, and there you must remain, for if you live a thousand years you will never know who got the blanket. A dead man could get up a better legend than this one. I don't mean a fresh dead man either, I mean a man that's been dead weeks and weeks. We struck the home trail now, and in a few hours were in that astonishing Chicago a city where they are always rubbing the lamp, and fetching up the genii, and contriving and achieving new impossibilities. It is hopeless for the occasional visitor to try to keep up with Chicago she outgrows his prophecies faster than he can make them. She is always a novelty, for she is never the Chicago you saw when you passed through the last time. The Pennsylvania road rushed us to New York without missing schedule time 10 minutes anywhere on the route, and there ended one of the most enjoyable 5,000-mile journeys I have ever had the good fortune to make. Appendix A From the New Orleans Times Democrat of March 29, 1882 Voyage of the Times Democrats relief boat through the inundated regions It was 9 o'clock Thursday morning when the Susie left the Mississippi and entered Old River, or what is now called the Mouth of the Red. Ascending on the left, a flood was pouring in through and over the levees on the Chandler Plantation, the most northern point in Point Capi Parish. The water completely covered the place, although the levees had given way but a short time before. The stock had been gathered in a large flatboat, where, without food, as we passed, the animals were huddled together, waiting for a boat to tow them off. On the right-hand side of the river is Tin Bulls Island, and on it is a large plantation which formerly was pronounced one of the most fertile in the state. 
the water has hitherto allowed it to go scot-free in usual floods, but now broad sheets of water told only where fields were. The top of the protecting levee could be seen here and there, but nearly all of it was submerged. The trees have put on a greener foliage since the water has poured in, and the woods look bright and fresh, but this pleasant aspect to the eye is neutralized by the interminable waste of water. We pass mile after mile, and it is nothing but trees standing up to their branches in water. A water turkey now and again rises and flies ahead into the long avenue of silence. A pierogi sometimes flits from the bushes and crosses the Red River on its way out to the Mississippi, but the sad-faced paddlers never turn their heads to look at our boat. The puffing of the boat is music in this gloom, which affects one most curiously. It is not the gloom of deep forests or dark caverns, but a peculiar kind of solemn silence and impressive awe that holds one perforce to its recognition. We passed two Negro families on a raft tied up in the willows this morning. They were evidently of the well-to-do class, as they had a supply of meal and three or four hogs with them. Their rafts were about twenty feet square, and in front of an improvised shelter earth had been placed, on which they built their fire. The current running down the Atchafalaya was very swift, the Mississippi showing a predilection in that direction, which needs only to be seen to enforce the opinion of that river's desperate endeavors to find a short way to the Gulf. Small boats, skiffs, pirogues, etc., are in great demand, and many have been stolen by piratical Negroes, who take them where they will bring the greatest price. From what was told me by Mr. C. P. Ferguson, a planter near Red River Landing, whose place has just gone under, there is much suffering in the rear of that place. The Negroes had given up all thoughts of a crevasse there, as the upper levee had stood so long, and when it did come they were at its mercy. On Thursday a number were taken out of trees and off of cabin roofs and brought in, many yet remaining. One does not appreciate the sight of earth until he has traveled through a flood. At sea one does not expect or look for it, but here, with fluttering leaves, shadowy forest aisles, house tops barely visible, it is expected. In fact a graveyard, if the mounds were above water, would be appreciated. The river here is known only because there is an opening in the trees, and that is all. It is in width, from Fort Adams on the left bank of the Mississippi to the bank of Rapides Parish, a distance of about 60 miles. A large portion of this was under cultivation, particularly along the Mississippi and back of the Red. When Red River proper was entered, a strong current was running directly across it, pursuing the same direction as that of the Mississippi. After a run of some hours, Black River was reached. Hardly was it entered before signs of suffering became visible. All the willows along the banks were stripped of their leaves. One man, whom your correspondent spoke to, said that he had had 150 head of cattle and 100 head of hogs. At the first appearance of water he had started to drive them to the highlands of Avoyles, 35 miles off, but he lost 50 head of the beef cattle and 60 hogs. Black River is quite picturesque, even if its shores are underwater. A dense growth of ash, oak, gum and hickory make the shores almost impenetrable, and where one can get a view down some avenue in the trees, only the dim outlines of distant trunks can be barely distinguished in the gloom. A few miles up this river, the depth of water on the banks was fully 8 feet, and on all sides could be seen, still holding against the strong current, the tops of cabins. Here and there one overturned was surrounded by driftwood, forming the nucleus of possibly some future island. In order to save coal, as it was impossible to get that fuel at any point to be touched during the expedition, a lookout was kept for a wood pile. On rounding a point a pierogi, skillfully paddled by a youth, shot out, and in its bow was a girl of fifteen, a fair face, beautiful black eyes, and demure manners. The boy asked for a paper, which was thrown to him, and the couple pushed their tiny craft out into the swell of the boat. Presently a little girl, not certainly over twelve years, paddled out in the smallest little canoe and handled it with all the deftness of an old voyageur. The little one looked more like an Indian than a white child, and laughed when asked if she were afraid. She had been raised in a pierogi and could go anywhere. 
she was bound out to pick willow leaves for the stock, and she pointed to a house nearby with water three inches deep on the floors. At its back door was moored a raft about thirty feet square, with a sort of fence built upon it, and inside of this some sixteen cows and twenty hogs were standing. The family did not complain, except on account of losing their stock, and promptly brought a supply of wood in a flat. From this point to the Mississippi River, fifteen miles, there is not a spot of earth above water, and to the westward for thirty-five miles there is nothing but the river's flood. Black River had risen during Thursday, the 23rd, one three-quarters inches, and was going up at night still. As we progress up the river habitations become more frequent, but are yet still miles apart. Nearly all of them are deserted, and the outhouses floated off. To add to the gloom, almost every living thing seems to have departed, and not a whistle of a bird nor the bark of the squirrel can be heard in this solitude. Sometimes a moroscar will throw his tail aloft and disappear in the river, but beyond this everything is quiet the quiet of dissolution. Down the river floats now a neatly whitewashed hen house, then a cluster of neatly split fence rails, or a door and a bloated carcass, solemnly guarded by a pair of buzzards, the only bird to be seen, which feast on the carcass as it bears them along. A picture frame in which there was a cheap lithograph of a soldier on horseback, as it floated on told of some hearth invaded by the water and despoiled of this ornament. At dark, as it was not prudent to run, a place alongside the woods was hunted and to a tall gum tree the boat was made fast for the night. A pretty quarter of the moon threw a pleasant light over forest and river, making a picture that would be a delightful piece of landscape study, could an artist only hold it down to his canvas. The motion of the engines had ceased, the puffing of the escaping steam was stilled, and the enveloping silence closed upon us, and such silence it was. Usually in a forest at night one can hear the piping of frogs, the hum of insects, or the dropping of limbs, but here nature was dumb. The dark recesses, those aisles into this cathedral, gave forth no sound, and even the ripplings of the current die away. At daylight Friday morning all hands were up, and up the black we started. The morning was a beautiful one, and the river, which is remarkably straight, put on its loveliest garb. The blossoms of the hawk perfumed the air deliciously, and a few birds whistled blithely along the banks. The trees were larger, and the forest seemed of older growth than below. More fields were passed than nearer the mouth, but the same scene presented itself smoke houses drifting out in the pastures, negro quarters anchored in confusion against some oak, and the modest residence just showing its eaves above water. The sun came up in a glory of carmine, and the trees were brilliant in their varied shades of green. Not a foot of soil is to be seen anywhere, and the water is apparently growing deeper and deeper, for it reaches up to the branches of the largest trees. All along, the bordering willows have been denuded of leaves, showing how long the people have been at work gathering this fodder for their animals. An old man in a pierogi was asked how the willow leaves agreed with his cattle. He stopped in his work, and with an ominous shake of his head replied, Well, sir, it s enough to keep warmth in their bodies and that's all we expect, but it's hard on the hogs, particularly the small ones. They is dropping off powerful fast. But what can you do? It s all we've got. At 30 miles above the mouth of Black River the water extends from Natchez on the Mississippi across to the Pine Hills of Louisiana, a distance of 73 miles, and there is hardly a spot that is not 10 feet under it. The tendency of the current up the Black is toward the west. In fact, so much is this the case, the waters of Red River have been driven down from toward the Calcasieu country, and the waters of the Black enter the Red some 15 miles above the mouth of the former, a thing never before seen by even the oldest steam boatman. The water now in sight of us is entirely from the Mississippi. Up to Trinity, or rather Troy, which is but a short distance below, the people have nearly all moved out, those remaining having enough for their present personal needs. Their cattle, though, are suffering and dying off quite fast, as the confinement on rafts and the food they get breeds disease. After a short stop we started, and soon came to a section where there were many open fields and cabins thickly scattered about. 
here were seen more pictures of distress. On the inside of the houses the inmates had built on boxes a scaffold on which they placed the furniture. The bedposts were sawed off on top, as the ceiling was not more than four feet from the improvised floor. The buildings looked very insecure, and threatened every moment to float off. Near the houses were cattle standing breast high in the water, perfectly impassive. They did not move in their places, but stood patiently waiting for help to come. The sight was a distressing one, and the poor creatures will be sure to die unless speedily rescued. Cattle differ from horses in this peculiar quality. A horse, after finding no relief comes, will swim off in search of food, whereas a beef will stand in its tracks until with exhaustion it drops in the water and drowns. At half past twelve o'clock a hail was given from a flatboat inside the line of the bank. Rounding to we ran alongside, and General York stepped aboard. He was just then engaged in getting off stock, and welcomed the Times Democrat boat heartily, as he said there was much need for her. He said that the distress was not exaggerated in the least. People were in a condition it was difficult even for one to imagine. The water was so high there was great danger of their houses being swept away. It had already risen so high that it was approaching the eaves, and when it reaches this point there is always imminent risk of their being swept away. If this occurs, there will be great loss of life. The general spoke of the gallant work of many of the people in their attempts to save their stock, but thought that fully 25 per cent had perished. Already 2,500 people had received rations from Troy, on Black River, and he had towed out a great many cattle, but a very great quantity remained and were in dire need. The water was now 18 inches higher than in 1874, and there was no land between Vidalia and the hills of Catahoula. At 2 o'clock the Susie reached Troy, 65 miles above the mouth of Black River. Here on the left comes in Little River, just beyond that the Washita, and on the right the Tensaw. These three rivers form the Black River. Troy, or a portion of it, is situated on and around three large Indian mounds, circular in shape, which rise above the present water about 12 feet. They are about 150 feet in diameter, and are about 200 yards apart. The houses are all built between these mounds, and hence are all flooded to a depth of 18 inches on their floors. These elevations, built by the Aborigines, hundreds of years ago, are the only points of refuge for miles. When we arrived we found them crowded with stock, all of which was thin and hardly able to stand up. They were mixed together, sheep, hogs, horses, mules, and cattle. One of these mounds has been used for many years as the graveyard, and today we saw attenuated cows lying against the marble tombstones, chewing their cut in contentment, after a meal of corn furnished by General York. Here, as below, the remarkable skill of the women and girls in the management of the smaller pirogues was noticed. Children were paddling about in these most ticklish crafts with all the nonchalance of adepts. General York has put into operation a perfect system in regard to furnishing relief. He makes a personal inspection of the place where it is asked, sees what is necessary to be done, and then, having two boats chartered, with flats, sends them promptly to the place, when the cattle are loaded and towed to the pine hills and uplands of Catahoula. He has made Troy his headquarters, and to this point boats come for their supply of feed for cattle. On the opposite side of Little River, which branches to the left out of Black, and between it and the Washita, is situated the town of Trinity, which is hourly threatened with destruction. It is much lower than Troy, and the water is eight and nine feet deep in the houses. A strong current sweeps through it, and it is remarkable that all of its houses have not gone before. The residents of both Troy and Trinity have been cared for, yet some of their stock have to be furnished with food. As soon as the Susie reached Troy, she was turned over to General York, and placed at his disposition to carry out the work of relief more rapidly. Nearly all her supplies were landed on one of the mounds to lighten her, and she was headed downstream to relieve those below. At Tom Hooper's place, a few miles from Troy, a large flat, with about 50 head of stock on board, was taken in tow. 
the animals were fed, and soon regained some strength. Today we go on Little River, where the suffering is greatest. Down Black River. Saturday evening, March 25th. We started down Black River quite early, under the direction of General York, to bring out what stock could be reached. Going down river a flat in tow was left in a central locality, and from there men pulled her back in the rear of plantations, picking up the animals wherever found. In the loft of a gin house there were seventeen head found, and after a gangway was built they were led down into the flat without difficulty. Taking a skiff with the general, your reporter was pulled up to a little house of two rooms, in which the water was standing two feet on the floors. In one of the large rooms were huddled the horses and cows of the place, while in the other the widow Taylor and her son were seated on a scaffold raised on the floor. One or two dugouts were drifting about in the room ready to be put in service at any time. When the flat was brought up, the side of the house was cut away as the only means of getting the animals out, and the cattle were driven on board the boat. General York, in this as in every case, inquired if the family desired to leave, informing them that Major Burke, of the Times Democrat, has sent the Susie up for that purpose. Mrs. Taylor said she thanked Major Burke, but she would try and hold out. The remarkable tenacity of the people here to their homes is beyond all comprehension. Just below, at a point 16 miles from Troy, information was received that the house of Mr. Tom Ellis was in danger, and his family were all in it. We steamed there immediately, and a sad picture was presented. Looking out of the half of the window left above water, was Mrs. Ellis, who is in feeble health, whilst at the door were her seven children, the oldest not fourteen years. One side of the house was given up to the work animals, some twelve head, besides hogs. In the next room the family lived, the water coming within two inches of the bed rail. The stove was below water, and the cooking was done on a fire on top of it. The house threatened to give way at any moment, one end of it was sinking, and, in fact, the building looked a mere shell. As the boat rounded to, Mr. Ellis came out in a dugout, and General York told him that he had come to his relief, that the Times Democrat boat was at his service, and would remove his family at once to the hills, and on Monday a flat would take out his stock, as, until that time, they would be busy. Notwithstanding the deplorable situation himself and family were in, Mr. Ellis did not want to leave. He said he thought he would wait until Monday, and take the risk of his house falling. The children around the door looked perfectly contented, seeming to care little for the danger they were in. These are but two instances of the many. After weeks of privation and suffering, People still cling to their houses and leave only when there is not room between the water and the ceiling to build a scaffold on which to stand. It seemed to be incomprehensible, yet the love for the old place was stronger than that for safety. After leaving the Ellis place, the next spot touched at was the Oswald place. Here the flat was towed alongside the gin house where there were fifteen heads standing in water, and yet, as they stood on scaffolds, their heads were above the top of the entrance. It was found impossible to get them out without cutting away a portion of the front, and so axes were brought into requisition and a gap made. After much labor the horses and mules were securely placed on the flat. At each place we stop there are always three, four, or more dugouts arriving, bringing information of stock in other places in need. Notwithstanding the fact that a great many had driven a part of their stock to the hills some time ago, there yet remains a large quantity, which General York, who is working with indomitable energy, will get landed in the Pine Hills by Tuesday. All along Black River the Susie has been visited by scores of planters, whose tales are the repetition of those already heard of suffering and loss. An old planter, who has lived on the river since 1844, said there never was such a rise, and he was satisfied more than one quarter of the stock has been lost. Luckily the people cared first for their work stock, and when they could find it horses and mules were housed in a place of safety. The rise which still continues, and was two inches last night, compels them to get them out to the hills, hence it is that the work of General York is of such a great value. 
from daylight to late at night he is going this way and that, cheering by his kindly words and directing with calm judgment what is to be done. One unpleasant story, of a certain merchant in New Orleans, is told all along the river. It appears for some years past the planters have been dealing with this individual, and many of them had balances in his hands. When the overflow came they wrote for coffee, for meal, and, in fact, for such little necessities as were required. No response to these letters came, and others were written, and yet these old customers, with plantations under water, were refused even what was necessary to sustain life. It is needless to say he is not popular now on Back River. The hills spoken of as the place of refuge for the people and stock on Black River are in Catahoula Parish, 24 miles from Black River. After filling the flat with cattle we took on board the family of T.S. Hooper, seven in number, who could not longer remain in their dwelling, and we are now taking them up Little River to the hills. The flood still rising. Troy, March 27, 1882, noon. The flood here is rising about three and a half inches every 24 hours, and rains have set in which will increase this. General York feels now that our efforts ought to be directed towards saving life, as the increase of the water has jeopardized many houses. We intend to go up the Tensaw in a few minutes, and then we will return and go down Black River to take off families. There is a lack of steam transportation here to meet the emergency. The General has three boats chartered, with flats in tow, but the demand for these to tow out stock is greater than they can meet with promptness. All are working night and day, and the Susie hardly stops for more than an hour anywhere. The rise has placed Trinity in a dangerous plight, and momentarily it is expected that some of the houses will float off. Troy is a little higher, yet all are in the water. Reports have come in that a woman and child have been washed away below here, and two cabins floated off. Their occupants are the same who refused to come off day before yesterday. One would not believe the utter passiveness of the people. As yet no news has been received of the steamer Delia, which is supposed to be the one sunk in yesterday's storm on Lake Catahoula. She is due here now, but has not arrived. Even the mail here is most uncertain, and this I send by skiff to Natchez to get it to you. It is impossible to get accurate data as to past crops, etc., as those who know much about the matter have gone, and those who remain are not well versed in the production of this section. General York desires me to say that the amount of rations formerly sent should be duplicated and sent at once. It is impossible to make any estimate, for the people are fleeing to the hills, so rapid is the rise. The residents here are in a state of commotion that can only be appreciated when seen, and complete demoralization has set in. If rations are drawn for any particular section hereabouts, they would not be certain to be distributed, so everything should be sent to Troy as a center, and the general will have it properly disposed of. He has sent for 100 tents, and, if all go to the hills who are in motion now, 200 will be required. Appendix B the Mississippi River Commission. The condition of this rich valley of the Lower Mississippi, immediately after and since the war, constituted one of the disastrous effects of war most to be deplored. Fictitious property in slaves was not only righteously destroyed, but very much of the work which had depended upon the slave labor was also destroyed or greatly impaired, especially the levy system. It might have been expected by those who have not investigated the subject, that such important improvements as the construction and maintenance of the levees would have been assumed at once by the several states. But what can the state do where the people are under subjection to rates of interest ranging from 18 to 30 per center and are also under the necessity of pledging their crops in advance even of planting, at these rates, for the privilege of purchasing all of their supplies at 100 per center profit? It has needed but little attention to make it perfectly obvious that the control of the Mississippi River, if undertaken at all, must be undertaken by the national government, and cannot be compassed by states. The river must be treated as a unit, its control cannot be compassed under a divided or separate system of administration. Neither are the states especially interested competent to combine among themselves for the necessary operations. The work must begin far up the river, 
at least as far as Cairo, if not beyond, and must be conducted upon a consistent general plan throughout the course of the river. It does not need technical or scientific knowledge to comprehend the elements of the case if one will give a little time and attention to the subject, and when a Mississippi River Commission has been constituted, as the existing commission is, of thoroughly able men of different walks in life, may it not be suggested that their verdict in the case should be accepted as conclusive, so far as any a priori theory of construction or control can be considered conclusive. It should be remembered that upon this board are General Gilmore, General Comstock, and General Souter, of the United States Engineers, Professor Henry Mitchell, the most competent authority on the question of hydrography, of the United States Coast Survey, B. B. Harrod, the state engineer of Louisiana, J. A. S. B. Eads, whose success with the jetties at New Orleans is a warrant of his competency, and Judge Taylor, of Indiana. It would be presumption on the part of any single man, however skilled, to contest the judgment of such a board as this. The method of improvement proposed by the Commission is at once in accord with the results of engineering experience and with observations of nature where meeting our wants. As in nature the growth of trees and their proneness where undermined to fall across the slope and support the bank secures at some points a fair depth of channel and some degree of permanence, so in the project of the engineer the use of timber and brush and the encouragement of forest growth are the main features. It is proposed to reduce the width where excessive by brushwood dikes, at first low, but raised higher and higher as the mud of the river settles under their shelter, and finally slope them back at the angle upon which willows will grow freely. In this work there are many details connected with the forms of these shelter dikes, their arrangements so as to present a series of settling basins, etc., a description of which would only complicate the conception. Through the larger part of the river works of contraction will not be required, but nearly all the banks on the concave side of the beds must be held against the wear of the stream, and much of the opposite banks defended at critical points. The works having in view this conservative object may be generally designated works of revetment, and these also will be largely of brushwood, woven in continuous carpets, or twined into wire netting. This veneering process has been successfully employed on the Missouri River, and in some cases they have so covered themselves with sediments, and have become so overgrown with willows, that they may be regarded as permanent. In securing these mats rubble stone is to be used in small quantities, and in some instances the dress slope between high and low river will have to be more or less paved with stone. Anyone who has been on the Rhine will have observed operations not unlike those to which we have just referred, and, indeed, most of the rivers of Europe flowing among their own alluvia have required similar treatment in the interest of navigation and agriculture. The levee is the crowning work of bank revetment, although not necessarily in immediate connection. It may be set back a short distance from the revet bank, but it is, in effect, the requisite parapet. The flood river and the low river cannot be brought into register, and compelled to unite in the excavation of a single permanent channel, without a complete control of all the stages, and even the abnormal rise must be provided against, because this would endanger the levee, and once in force behind the works of revetment would tear them also away. Under the general principle that the local slope of a river is the result and measure of the resistance of its bed, it is evident that a narrow and deep stream should have less slope, because it has less frictional surface in proportion to capacity, i.e., less perimeter in proportion to area of cross-section. The ultimate effect of levees and revetments confining the floods and bringing all the stages of the river into register is to deepen the channel and let down the slope. The first effect of the levees is to raise the surface, but this, by inducing greater velocity of flow, inevitably causes an enlargement of section, and if this enlargement is prevented from being made at the expense of the banks, the bottom must give way and the form of the waterway be so improved as to admit this flow with less rise. The actual experience with levees upon the Mississippi River, with no attempt to hold the banks, has been favorable, and no one can doubt, upon the evidence furnished in the reports of the Commission, that if the earliest levees had been accompanied by revetment of banks, and made complete, we should have today a river navigable at low water, and an adjacent country safe from inundation.
Of course it would be illogical to conclude that the constrained river can ever lower its flood slope so as to make levees unnecessary, but it is believed that, by this lateral constraint, the river as a conduit may be so improved in form that even those rare floods which result from the coincident rising of many tributaries will find vent without destroying levees of ordinary height. That the actual capacity of a channel through alluvium depends upon its service during floods has been often shown, but this capacity does not include anomalous, but recurrent, floods. It is hardly worthwhile to consider the projects for relieving the Mississippi River floods by creating new outlets, since these sensational propositions have commended themselves only to unthinking minds, and have no support among engineers. Were the riverbed cast iron, a resort to openings for surplus waters might be a necessity, but as the bottom is yielding, and the best form of outlet is a single deep channel, as realizing the least ratio of perimeter to area of cross-section, there could not well be a more unphilosophical method of treatment than the multiplication of avenues of escape. In the foregoing statement the attempt has been made to condense in as limited a space as the importance of the subject would permit, the general elements of the problem, and the general features of the proposed method of improvement which has been adopted by the Mississippi River Commission. The writer cannot help feeling that it is somewhat presumptuous on his part to attempt to present the facts relating to an enterprise which calls for the highest scientific skill, but it is a matter which interests every citizen of the United States, and is one of the methods of reconstruction which ought to be approved. It is a war claim which implies no private gain, and no compensation except for one of the cases of destruction incident to war, which may well be repaired by the people of the whole country. Edward Atkinson. Boston, April 14, 1882. Appendix C. Reception of Captain Basil Hall's book in the United States. Having now arrived nearly at the end of our travels, I am induced, ere I conclude, again to mention what I consider as one of the most remarkable traits in the national character of the Americans, namely, their exquisite sensitiveness and soreness respecting everything said or written concerning them. Of this, perhaps, the most remarkable example I can give is the effect produced on nearly every class of readers by the appearance of Captain Basil Hall's travels in North America. In fact, it was a sort of moral earthquake, and the vibration it occasioned through the nerves of the Republic, from one corner of the Union to the other, was by no means over when I left the country in July 1831, a couple of years after the shock. I was in Cincinnati when these volumes came out, but it was not till July 1830, that I procured a copy of them. One bookseller to whom I applied told me that he had had a few copies before he understood the nature of the work, but that, after becoming acquainted with it, nothing should induce him to sell another. Other persons of his profession must, however, have been less scrupulous, for the book was read in city, town, village, and hamlet, steamboat, and stagecoach, and a sort of war hoop was sent forth perfectly unprecedented in my recollection upon any occasion whatever. An ardent desire for approbation, and a delicate sensitiveness under censure, have always, I believe, been considered as amiable traits of character, but the condition into which the appearance of Captain Hall's work through the Republic shows plainly that these feelings, if carried to excess, produce a weakness which amounts to imbecility. It was perfectly astonishing to hear men who, on other subjects, were of some judgment, utter their opinions upon this. I never heard of any instance in which the common sense generally found in national criticism was so overthrown by passion. I do not speak of the want of justice, and of fair and liberal interpretation, these, perhaps, were hardly to be expected. Other nations have been called thin-skinned, but the citizens of the Union have, apparently, no skins at all, they wince if a breeze blows over them, unless it be tempered with adulation. It was not, therefore, very surprising that the acute and forcible observations of a traveler they knew would be listened to should be received testily. The extraordinary features of the business were, first, the excess of the rage into which they lashed themselves, and, secondly, the puerility of the inventions by which they attempted to account for the severity with which they fancied they had been treated. Not content with declaring that the volumes contained no word of truth, from beginning to end, 
which is an assertion I heard made very nearly as often as they were mentioned, the whole country set to work to discover the causes why Captain Hall had visited the United States, and why he had published his book. I have heard it said with as much precision and gravity as if the statement had been conveyed by an official report, that Captain Hall had been sent out by the British government expressly for the purpose of checking the growing admiration of England for the government of the United States that it was by a commission from the Treasury he had come, and that it was only in obedience to orders that he had found anything to object to. I do not give this as the gossip of a coterie, I am persuaded that it is the belief of a very considerable portion of the country. So deep is the conviction of this singular people that they cannot be seen without being admired, that they will not admit the possibility that anyone should honestly and sincerely find ought to disapprove in them or their country. The American reviews are, many of them, I believe, well known in England, I need not, therefore, quote them here, but I sometimes wondered that they, none of them, ever thought of translating Obadiah's curse into classic American, if they had done so, on placing, he, Basil Hall, between brackets, instead of, he, Obadiah, it would have saved them a world of trouble. I can hardly describe the curiosity with which I sat down at length to peruse these tremendous volumes, still less can I do justice to my surprise at their contents. To say that I found not one exaggerated statement throughout the work is by no means saying enough. It is impossible for anyone who knows the country not to see that Captain Hall earnestly sought out things to admire and commend. When he praises, it is with evident pleasure, and when he finds fault, it is with evident reluctance and restraint, excepting where motives purely patriotic urge him to state roundly what it is for the benefit of his country should be known. In fact, Captain Hall saw the country to the greatest possible advantage. Furnished, of course, with letters of introduction to the most distinguished individuals, and with the still more influential recommendation of his own reputation, he was received in full drawing-room style and state from one end of the Union to the other. He saw the country in full dress, and had little or no opportunity of judging of it unhouseled, unanointed, unannealed, with all its imperfections on its head, as I and my family too often had. Captain Hall had certainly excellent opportunities of making himself acquainted with the form of the government and the laws, and of receiving, moreover, the best oral commentary upon them, in conversation with the most distinguished citizens. Of these opportunities he made excellent use, nothing important met his eye which did not receive that sort of analytical attention which an experienced and philosophical traveler alone can give. This has made his volumes highly interesting and valuable, but I am deeply persuaded, that were a man of equal penetration to visit the United States with no other means of becoming acquainted with the national character than the ordinary working day intercourse of life, he would conceive an infinitely lower idea of the moral atmosphere of the country than Captain Hall appears to have done, and the internal conviction on my mind is strong, that if Captain Hall had not placed a firm restraint on himself, he must have given expression to far deeper indignation than any he has uttered against many points in the American character, with which he shows from other circumstances that he was well acquainted. His rule appears to have been to state just so much of the truth as would leave on the mind of his readers a correct impression, at the least cost of pain to the sensitive folks he was writing about. He states his own opinions and feelings, and leaves it to be inferred that he has good grounds for adopting them, but he spares the Americans the bitterness which a detail of the circumstances would have produced. If anyone chooses to say that some wicked antipathy to twelve millions of strangers is the origin of my opinion, I must bear it, and were the question one of mere idle speculation, I certainly would not court the abuse I must meet for stating it. But it is not so. The candor which he expresses, and evidently feels, they mistake for irony, or totally distrust, his unwillingness to give pain to persons from whom he has received kindness, they scornfully reject as affectation, and although they must know right well, in their own secret hearts, how infinitely more they lay at his mercy than he has chosen to betray, they pretend, even to themselves, that he has exaggerated the bad points of their character and institutions, whereas, the truth is, that he has. Let them off with a degree of tenderness which may be quite suitable for him to exercise, 
however little merited, while, at the same time, he has most industriously magnified their merits, whenever he could possibly find anything favorable. Appendix D. The Undying Head. In a remote part of the north lived a man and his sister, who had never seen a human being. Seldom, if ever, had the man any cause to go from home, for, as his wants demanded food, he had only to go a little distance from the lodge, and there, in some particular spot, place his arrows, with their barbs in the ground. Telling his sister where they had been placed, every morning she would go in search, and never fail of finding each stuck through the heart of a deer. She had then only to drag them into the lodge and prepare their food. Thus she lived till she attained womanhood, when one day her brother, whose name was Imo, said to her, Sister, the time is at hand when you will be ill. Listen to my advice. If you do not, it will probably be the cause of my death. Take the implements with which we kindle our fires. Go some distance from our lodge and build a separate fire. When you are in want of food, I will tell you where to find it. You must cook for yourself, and I will for myself. When you are ill, do not attempt to come near the lodge, or bring any of the utensils you use. Be sure always to fasten to your belt the implements you need, for you do not know when the time will come. As for myself, I must do the best I can. His sister promised to obey him in all he had said. Shortly after, her brother had cause to go from home. She was alone in her lodge, combing her hair. She had just untied the belt to which the implements were fastened, when suddenly the event, to which her brother had alluded, occurred. She ran out of the lodge, but in her haste forgot the belt. Afraid to return, she stood for some time thinking. Finally, she decided to enter the lodge and get it. For, thought she, my brother is not at home, and I will stay but a moment to catch hold of it. She went back. Running in suddenly, she caught hold of it, and was coming out when her brother came in sight. He knew what was the matter. Oh, he said, did I not tell you to take care? But now you have killed me. She was going on her way, but her brother said to her, what can you do there now? The accident has happened. Go in, and stay where you have always stayed. And what will become of you? You have killed me. He then laid aside his hunting dress and accoutrements, and soon after both his feet began to turn black, so that he could not move. Still he directed his sister where to place the arrows, that she might always have food. The inflammation continued to increase, and had now reached his first rib, and he said, Sister, my end is near. You must do as I tell you. You see my medicine sack, and my war club tied to it. It contains all my medicines, and my war plumes, and my paints of all colors. As soon as the inflammation reaches my breast, you will take my war club. It has a sharp point, and you will cut off my head. When it is free from my body, take it, place its neck in the sack, which you must open at one end. Then hang it up in its former place. Do not forget my bow and arrows. One of the last you will take to procure food. The remainder, tie in my sack, and then hang it up, so that I can look towards the door. Now and then I will speak to you, but not often. His sister again promised to obey. In a little time his breast was affected. Now, said he, take the club and strike off my head. She was afraid, but he told her to muster courage. Strike, said he, and a smile was on his face. Mustering all her courage, she gave the blow and cut off the head. Now, said the head, place me where I told you. And fearfully she obeyed it in all its commands. Retaining its animation, it looked around the lodge as usual, and it would command its sister to go in such places as it thought would procure for her the flesh of different animals she needed. One day the head said, The time is not distant when I shall be freed from this situation, and I shall have to undergo many sore evils. So the superior Manito decrees, and I must bear all patiently. In this situation we must leave the head. 
in a certain part of the country was a village inhabited by a numerous and warlike band of Indians. In this village was a family of ten young men brothers. It was in the spring of the year that the youngest of these blackened his face and fasted. His dreams were propitious. Having ended his fast, he went secretly for his brothers at night, so that none in the village could overhear or find out the direction they intended to go. Though their drum was heard, yet that was a common occurrence. Having ended the usual formalities, he told how favorable his dreams were, and that he had called them together to know if they would accompany him in a war excursion. They all answered they would. The third brother from the eldest, noted for his oddities, coming up with his war club when his brother had ceased speaking, jumped up. Yes, said he, I will go, and this will be the way I will treat those I am going to fight, and he struck the post in the center of the lodge, and gave a yell. The others spoke to him, saying, Slow, slow, Mujikwes, when you are in other people's lodges. So he sat down. Then, in turn, they took the drum, and sang their songs, and closed with a feast. The youngest told them not to whisper their intention to their wives, but secretly to prepare for their journey. They all promised obedience, and Mujikwes was the first to say so. The time for their departure drew near. Word was given to assemble on a certain night, when they would depart immediately. Mujikwes was loud in his demands for his moccasins. Several times his wife asked him the reason. Besides, said she, you have a good pair on. Quick, quick, said he, since you must know, we are going on a war excursion, so be quick. He thus revealed the secret. That night they met and started. The snow was on the ground, and they traveled all night, lest others should follow them. When it was daylight, the leader took snow and made a ball of it, then tossing it into the air, he said, it was in this way I saw snow fall in a dream, so that I could not be tracked. And he told them to keep close to each other for fear of losing themselves, as the snow began to fall in very large flakes. Near as they walked, it was with difficulty they could see each other. The snow continued falling all that day and the following night, so it was impossible to track them. They had now walked for several days, and Mujikwes was always in the rear. One day, running suddenly forward, he gave the Sasa Shuan, 23 and struck a tree with his war club, and it broke into pieces as if struck with lightning. Brothers, said he, this will be the way I will serve those we are going to fight. The leader answered, slow, slow, Mujikwes, the one I lead you to is not to be thought of so lightly. Again he fell back and thought to himself, what, what, who can this be he is leading us to? He felt fearful and was silent. Day after day they traveled on, till they came to an extensive plain, on the borders of which human bones were bleaching in the sun. The leader spoke, they are the bones of those who have gone before us. None has ever yet returned to tell the sad tale of their fate. Again Mujikwes became restless, and, running forward, gave the accustomed yell. Advancing to a large rock which stood above the ground, he struck it, and it fell to pieces. See, brothers, said he, thus will I treat those whom we are going to fight. Still, still, once more said the leader, he to whom I am leading you is not to be compared to the rock. Mujikwes fell back thoughtful, saying to himself, I wonder who this can be that he is going to attack, and he was afraid. Still they continued to see the remains of former warriors, who had been to the place where they were now going, some of whom had retreated as far back as the place where they first saw the bones, beyond which no one had ever escaped. At last they came to a piece of rising ground, from which they plainly distinguished, sleeping on a distant mountain, a mammoth bear. The distance between them was very great, but the size of the animal caused him to be plainly seen. There, said the leader, it is he to whom I am leading you, here our troubles will commence, for he is a Mishimakwa and a Manito. It is he who has that we prize so dearly, i.e. Wampum, to obtain which, the warriors whose bones we saw, sacrificed their lives. You must not be fearful, be manly. 
we shall find him asleep. Then the leader went forward and touched the belt around the animal's neck. This, said he, is what we must get. It contains the wampum. Then they requested the eldest to try and slip the belt over the bear's head, who appeared to be fast asleep, as he was not in the least disturbed by the attempt to obtain the belt. All their efforts were in vain, till it came to the one next the youngest. He tried, and the belt moved nearly over the monster's head, but he could get it no farther. Then the youngest one, and the leader, made his attempt, and succeeded. Placing it on the back of the oldest, he said, now we must run, and off they started. When one became fatigued with its weight, another would relieve him. Thus they ran till they had passed the bones of all former warriors, and were some distance beyond, when looking back, they saw the monster slowly rising. He stood some time before he missed his wampum. Soon they heard his tremendous howl, like distant thunder, slowly filling all the sky, and then they heard him speak and say, who can it be that has dared to steal my wampum? Earth is not so large but that I can find them, and he descended from the hill in pursuit. As if convulsed, the earth shook with every jump he made. Very soon he approached the party. They, however, kept the belt, exchanging it from one to another, and encouraging each other, but he gained on them fast. Brothers, said the leader, has never any one of you, when fasting, dreamed of some friendly spirit who would aid you as a guardian. A dead silence followed. Well, said he, fasting, I dreamed of being in danger of instant death, when I saw a small lodge, with smoke curling from its top. An old man lived in it, and I dreamed he helped me, and may it be verified soon, he said, running forward and giving the peculiar yell, and a howl as if the sounds came from the depths of his stomach, and what is called chi caught him. Getting upon a piece of rising ground, behold, a lodge, with smoke curling from its top, appeared. This gave them all new strength, and they ran forward and entered it. The leader spoke to the old man who sat in the lodge, saying, Nemsho, help us, we claim your protection, for the great bear will kill us. Sit down and eat, my grandchildren, said the old man who is a great manito, said he. There is none but me, but let me look, and he opened the door of the lodge, when, lo! At a little distance he saw the enraged animal coming on, with slow but powerful leaps. He closed the door. Yes, said he, he is indeed a great manito, my grandchildren, you will be the cause of my losing my life, you asked my protection, and I granted it, so now, come what may. I will protect you. When the bear arrives at the door, you must run out of the other door of the lodge. Then putting his hand to the side of the lodge where he sat, he brought out a bag which he opened. Taking out two small black dogs, he placed them before him. These are the ones I use when I fight, said he, and he commenced patting with both hands the sides of one of them, and he began to swell out, so that he soon filled the lodge by his bulk and he had great strong teeth. When he attained his full size he growled, and from that moment, as from instinct, he jumped out at the door and met the bear, who in another leap would have reached the lodge. A terrible combat ensued. The skies rang with the howls of the fierce monsters. The remaining dog soon took the field. The brothers, at the onset, took the advice of the old man, and escaped through the opposite side of the lodge. They had not proceeded far before they heard the dying cry of one of the dogs, and soon after of the other. Well, said the leader, the old man will share their fate, so run, he will soon be after us. They started with fresh vigor, for they had received food from the old man, but very soon the bear came in sight, and again was fast gaining upon them. Again the leader asked the brothers if they could do nothing for their safety. All were silent. The leader, running forward, did as before. I dreamed, he cried, that, being in great trouble, an old man helped me who was a manito, we shall soon see his lodge. Taking courage, they still went on. After going a short distance they saw the lodge of the old manito. 
they entered immediately and claimed his protection, telling him a manito was after them. The old man, setting meat before them, said, Eat. Who is a manito? There is no manito but me, there is none whom I fear, and the earth trembled as the monster advanced. The old man opened the door and saw him coming. He shut it slowly, and said, Yes, my grandchildren, you have brought trouble upon me. Procuring his medicine sack, he took out his small war clubs of black stone, and told the young men to run through the other side of the lodge. As he handled the clubs, they became very large, and the old man stepped out just as the bear reached the door. Then striking him with one of the clubs, it broke in pieces, the bear stumbled. Renewing the attempt with the other war club, that also was broken, but the bear fell senseless. Each blow the old man gave him sounded like a clap of thunder, and the howls of the bear ran along till they filled the heavens. The young men had now run some distance, when they looked back. They could see that the bear was recovering from the blows. First he moved his paws, and soon they saw him rise on his feet. The old man shared the fate of the first, for they now heard his cries as he was torn in pieces. Again the monster was in pursuit, and fast overtaking them. Not yet discouraged, the young men kept on their way, but the bear was now so close, that the leader once more applied to his brothers, but they could do nothing. Well, said he, my dreams will soon be exhausted, after this I have but one more. He advanced, invoking his guardian spirit to aid him. Once, said he, I dreamed that, being sorely pressed, I came to a large lake, on the shore of which was a canoe, partly out of water, having ten paddles all in readiness. Do not fear, he cried, we shall soon get it. And so it was, even as he had said. Coming to the lake, they saw the canoe with ten paddles, and immediately they embarked. Scarcely had they reached the center of the lake, when they saw the bear arrive at its borders. Lifting himself on his hind legs, he looked all around. Then he waded into the water, then losing his footing he turned back, and commenced making the circuit of the lake. Meantime the party remained stationary in the center to watch his movements. He traveled all around, till at last he came to the place from whence he started. Then he commenced drinking up the water, and they saw the current fast setting in towards his open mouth. The leader encouraged them to paddle hard for the opposite shore. When only a short distance from land, the current had increased so much, that they were drawn back by it, and all their efforts to reach it were in vain. Then the leader again spoke, telling them to meet their fates manfully. Now is the time, Mujiquis, said he, to show your prowess. Take courage and sit at the bow of the canoe, and when it approaches his mouth, try what effect your club will have on his head. He obeyed, and stood ready to give the blow, while the leader, who steered, directed the canoe for the open mouth of the monster. Rapidly advancing, they were just about to enter his mouth, when Mujiqui struck him a tremendous blow on the head, and gave the sausage one. The bear's limbs doubled under him, and he fell, stunned by the blow. But before Mujiqui could renew it, the monster disgorged all the water he had drank, with a force which sent the canoe with great velocity to the opposite shore. Instantly leaving the canoe, again they fled, and on they went till they were completely exhausted. The earth again shook, and soon they saw the monster hard after them. Their spirits drooped, and they felt discouraged. The leader exerted himself, by actions and words, to cheer them up, and once more he asked them if they thought of nothing, or could do nothing for their rescue, and, as before, all were silent. Then, he said, this is the last time I can apply to my guardian spirit. Now, if we do not succeed, our fates are decided. He ran forward, invoking his spirit with great earnestness, and gave the yell. We shall soon arrive, said he to his brothers, at the place where my last guardian spirit dwells. In him I place great confidence. Do not, do not be afraid, or your limbs will be fear-bound. We shall soon reach his lodge. Run, run, he cried. 
Returning now to Imo, he had passed all the time in the same condition we had left him, the head directing his sister, in order to procure food, where to place the magic arrows, and speaking at long intervals. One day the sister saw the eyes of the head brighten, as if with pleasure. At last it spoke. Oh, sister, it said, in what a pitiful situation you have been the cause of placing me. Soon, very soon, a party of young men will arrive and apply to me for aid, but alas! How can I give what I would have done with so much pleasure? Nevertheless, take two arrows, and place them where you have been in the habit of placing the others, and have meat prepared and cooked before they arrive. When you hear them coming and calling on my name, go out and say, Alas, it is long ago that an accident befell him. I was the cause of it. If they still come near, ask them in, and set meat before them. And now you must follow my directions strictly. When the bear is near, go out and meet him. You will take my medicine sack, bows and arrows, and my head. You must then untie the sack, and spread out before you my paints of all colors, my war eagle feathers, my tufts of dried hair, and whatever else it contains. As the bear approaches, you will take all these articles, one by one, and say to him, this is my deceased brother's paint, and so on with all the other articles, throwing each of them as far as you can. The virtues contained in them will cause him to totter, and, to complete his destruction, you will take my head, and that too you will cast as far off as you can, crying aloud, see, this is my deceased brother's head. He will then fall senseless. By this time the young men will have eaten, and you will call them to your assistance. You must then cut the carcass into pieces, yes, into small pieces, and scatter them to the four winds, for, unless you do this, he will again revive. She promised that all should be done as he said. She had only time to prepare the meat, when the voice of the leader was heard calling upon Imo for aid. The woman went out and said as her brother had directed. But the war party being closely pursued, came up to the lodge. She invited them in, and placed the meat before them. While they were eating, they heard the bear approaching. Untying the medicine sack and taking the head, she had all in readiness for his approach. When he came up she did as she had been told, and, before she had expended the paints and feathers, the bear began to totter, but, still advancing, came close to the woman. Saying as she was commanded, she then took the head, and cast it as far from her as she could. As it rolled along the ground, the blood, excited by the feelings of the head in this terrible scene, gushed from the nose and mouth. The bear, tottering, soon fell with a tremendous noise. Then she cried for help, and the young men came rushing out, having partially regained their strength and spirits. Mujikwes, stepping up, gave a yell and struck him a blow upon the head. This he repeated, till it seemed like a mass of brains, while the others, as quick as possible, cut him into very small pieces, which they then scattered in every direction. While thus employed, happening to look around where they had thrown the meat, wonderful to behold, they saw starting up and turning off in every direction small black bears, such as are seen at the present day. The country was soon overspread with these black animals. And it was from this monster that the present race of bears derived their origin. Having thus overcome their pursuer, they returned to the lodge. In the meantime, the woman, gathering the implements she had used, and the head, placed them again in the sack. But the head did not speak again, probably from its great exertion to overcome the monster. Having spent so much time and traversed so vast a country in their flight, the young men gave up the idea of ever returning to their own country, and game being plenty, they determined to remain where they now were. One day they moved off some distance from the lodge for the purpose of hunting, having left the wampum with the woman. They were very successful, and amused themselves, as all young men do when alone, by talking and jesting with each other. One of them spoke and said, We have all this sport to ourselves, let us go and ask our sister if she will not let us bring the head to this place, as it is still alive. 
it may be pleased to hear us talk, and be in our company. In the meantime take food to our sister. They went and requested the head. She told them to take it, and they took it to their hunting grounds, and tried to amuse it, but only at times did they see its eyes beam with pleasure. One day, while busy in their encampment, they were unexpectedly attacked by unknown Indians. The skirmish was long contested and bloody, many of their foes were slain, but still they were thirty to one. The young men fought desperately till they were all killed. The attacking party then retreated to a height of ground, to muster their men, and to count the number of missing and slain. One of their young men had stayed away, and, in endeavoring to overtake them, came to the place where the head was hung up. Seeing that alone retain animation, he eyed it for some time with fear and surprise. However, he took it down and opened the sack, and was much pleased to see the beautiful feathers, one of which he placed on his head. Starting off, it waved gracefully over him till he reached his party, when he threw down the head and sack, and told them how he had found it, and that the sack was full of paints and feathers. They all looked at the head and made sport of it. Numbers of the young men took the paint and painted themselves, and one of the party took the head by the hair and said look, you ugly thing, and see your paints on the faces of warriors. But the feathers were so beautiful, that numbers of them also placed them on their heads. Then again they used all kinds of indignity to the head, for which they were in turn repaid by the death of those who had used the feathers. Then the chief commanded them to throw away all except the head. We will see, said he, when we get home, what we can do with it. We will try to make it shut its eyes. When they reached their homes they took it to the council lodge, and hung it up before the fire, fastening it with rawhide soaked, which would shrink and become tightened by the action of the fire. We will then see, they said, if we cannot make it shut its eyes. Meantime, for several days, the sister had been waiting for the young men to bring back the head, till, at last, getting impatient, she went in search of it. The young men she found lying within short distances of each other, dead and covered with wounds. Various other bodies lay scattered in different directions around them. She searched for the head and sack, but they were nowhere to be found. She raised her voice and wept, and blackened her face. Then she walked in different directions, till she came to the place from whence the head had been taken. Then she found the magic bow and arrows, where the young men, ignorant of their qualities, had left them. She thought to herself that she would find her brother's head, and came to a piece of rising ground, and there saw some of his paints and feathers. These she carefully put up, and hung upon the branch of a tree till her return. At dusk she arrived at the first lodge of a very extensive village. Here she used a charm, common among Indians when they wished to meet with a kind reception. On applying to the old man and woman of the lodge, she was kindly received. She made known her errand. The old man promised to aid her, and told her the head was hung up before the council fire, and that the chiefs of the village, with their young men, kept watch over it continually. The former are considered as manitos. She said she only wished to see it, and would be satisfied if she could only get to the door of the lodge. She knew she had not sufficient power to take it by force. Come with me, said the Indian, I will take you there. They went and they took their seats near the door. The council lodge was filled with warriors, amusing themselves with games, and constantly keeping up a fire to smoke the head, as they said, to make dry meat. They saw the head move, and not knowing what to make of it, one spoke and said, Ha, ha! It is beginning to feel the effects of the smoke. The sister looked up from the door, and her eyes met those of her brother, and tears rolled down the cheeks of the head. Well, said the chief, I thought we would make you do something at last. Look. Look at it shedding tears, said he to those around him, and they all laughed and passed their jokes upon it. The chief, looking around, and observing the woman, after some time said to the man who came with her, Who have you got there? I have never seen that woman before in our village. Yes, replied the man, you have seen her, 
she is a relation of mine, and seldom goes out. She stays at my lodge, and asked me to allow her to come with me to this place. In the center of the lodge sat one of those young men who are always forward, and fond of boasting and displaying themselves before others. Why, said he, I have seen her often, and it is to this lodge I go almost every night to court her. All the others laughed and continued their games. The young man did not know he was telling a lie to the woman's advantage, who by that means escaped. She returned to the man's lodge, and immediately set out for her own country. Coming to the spot where the bodies of her adopted brothers lay, she placed them together, their feet toward the east. Then taking an axe which she had, she cast it up into the air, crying out, Brothers, get up from under it, or it will fall on you. This she repeated three times, and the third time the brothers all arose and stood on their feet. Mujiquis commenced rubbing his eyes and stretching himself. Why, said he, I have overslept myself. No, indeed, said one of the others, do you not know we were all killed, and that it is our sister who has brought us to life? The young men took the bodies of their enemies and burned them. Soon after, the woman went to procure wives for them, in a distant country, they knew not where, but she returned with ten young women, which she gave to the ten young men, beginning with the eldest. Mujiqui stepped to and fro, uneasy lest he should not get the one he liked. But he was not disappointed, for she fell to his lot. And they were well matched, for she was a female magician. They then all moved into a very large lodge, and their sister told them that the women must now take turns in going to her brother's head every night, trying to untie it. They all said they would do so with pleasure. The eldest made the first attempt, and with a rushing noise she fled through the air. Toward daylight she returned. She had been unsuccessful, as she succeeded in untying only one of the knots. All took their turns regularly, and each one succeeded in untying only one knot each time. But when the youngest went, she commenced the work as soon as she reached the lodge, although it had always been occupied, still the Indians never could see anyone. For ten nights now, the smoke had not ascended, but filled the lodge and drove them out. This last night they were all driven out, and the young woman carried off the head. The young people and the sister heard the young woman coming high through the air, and they heard her saying, Prepare the body of our brother. And as soon as they heard it, they went to a small lodge where the black body of Imo lay. His sister commenced cutting the neck part, from which the neck had been severed. She cut so deep as to cause it to bleed, and the others who were present, by rubbing the body and applying medicines, expelled the blackness. In the meantime, the one who brought it, by cutting the neck of the head, caused that also to bleed. As soon as she arrived, they placed that close to the body, and, by aid of medicines and various other means, succeeded in restoring Imo to all his former beauty and manliness. All rejoiced in the happy termination of their troubles, and they had spent some time joyfully together, when Imo said, Now I will divide the wampum, and getting the belt which contained it, he commenced with the eldest, giving it in equal portions. But the youngest got the most splendid and beautiful, as the bottom of the belt held the richest and rarest. They were told that, since they had all once died, and were restored to life, they were no longer mortal, but spirits, and they were assigned different stations in the invisible world. Only Mujiquiz's place was, however, named. He was to direct the west wind, hence generally called Kabeun, there to remain forever. They were commanded, as they had it in their power, to do good to the inhabitants of the earth, and, forgetting their sufferings in procuring the wampum, to give all things with a liberal hand. And they were also commanded that it should also be held by them sacred, those grains or shells of the pale hue to be emblematic of peace, while those of the darker hue would lead to evil and war. The spirits then, amid songs and shouts, took their flight to their respective abodes on high, while Imo, with his sister Imaqua, descended into the depths below. The End Thank you for spending some time with us. Please do subscribe to audiobooks on house and we'll meet in next audiobook.